Hi, this is Tunde. And this is Ruth. And we are recording this from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, we want to welcome you to the African Scramble digital event. Yeah, we've been working on this digital event for the last month or so here in Lagos. Yeah, we've been uh, in Lagos traveling to a couple of cities here, filming for our docuseries as we work on this and... We hope you enjoy the programming slate. Yes, and we have contributors from here in Nigeria and Lagos. We have folks from Addis Ababa and Ethiopia. From the Bay Area. Yeah, the Bay from all over. The United States, uh, New York area. Mm -hmm. Chicago. So it's it's a global event. Yeah, it's a global event of sorts. (laughs) Nigeria, the United States... Yeah. Definitely continental and diasporic, which is the idea of the event. Anyway, um, it's three hours of programming. We hope you stay for everything or at least drop in uh, for some things. So, yeah, enjoy. All right, so this is a conversation between El Sadiq, uh, El Sheikh, and Adam Gitacho. It's a conversation we conceived of very early when we're thinking about this digital event for the magazine, and we're so excited that both of them were available to, to have it. Yeah, um, El Sadi was a contrib- or is a contributor to the magazine, and when he was writing his piece, um, subsidized this in the magazine, I remember I was in Lagos, and you were I was in, Berkeley. in Berkeley, and we had this three-way conversation between myself, El Sadi, and and you yeah. and El Sadiq was like breaking down sort of like the power dynamics of um, of the, the sort of the colonial uh, relationship and then he had mentioned two scholars that um, were influencing his thinking Samir Amin and Adam yes and so uh, we wanted we knew we wanted um, her work in in the magazine somehow and so we're glad that this is the way that's happening yeah it's a really excellent conversation and there's so much to pull like so many threads you can go and uh spiral off of so (laughs) we hope you find at least one or two to do that paris adam can you just start us by telling us uh why you have chosen word making as the title of your book Great. Um, uh, Thanks so much. And it's so nice to be in conversation with you. Um, So I chose to the the term world making because I wanted to capture the global scale um, at which decolonization was imagined, at which uh, efforts at uh, ensuring independence in Africa and the Caribbean were really thought and institutionalized or attempted to be institutionalized at a global level. And for me, that stems also from a prior kind set of arguments that Black intellectuals made, especially in the interwar period. People like um, W.E.B. Du Bois, Eric Williams, C.L.R. James, but also some of the people who ended up being their students and who would lead independence movements like Kwame Nkrumah. What they learned, what their arguments about uh, empire, that empire actually had made a world. Like it's not just that Britain had colonized Ghana or Jamaica, but the practice of European imperial expansion had created, um, integrated the world, right? But integrated the world on unequal terms. It had created uh, forms of dependence, forms of exploitation that structured the world order. So to decolonize meant not only to secure the independence of specific states, but to transform that world of unequal relations. Great, great. Uh, can also, let me be greedy a little bit and, and to press on you more. Uh, can you tell us more about those Black transnational intellectuals and thinkers you have studied? And what role do they have played in cementing the critique of the empire in their and their quest for self-determination and decolonization for people of African descent. Yeah, I mean, one thing about the book is that it focuses both, I mean, it's a long list of names, which I'll say in a minute, but it. I was really interested in um, thinking about black intellectuals as 
part of an international and a part of a transnational network, as you've already put it. So some of the figures include W.E.B. Du Bois, who's really an older statesman of Pan-Africanism, right? Someone who had played a key role in the 1919 Pan-African Congress, um, but it, you know, comes from, a, is an older generation. He's born in 1868. Um, um, then we have figures like uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Eric Williams, who were born just before World War I, uh, around 1909, 1910. Uh, then we have a kind of younger cohort of people represented in the book by Julius Nerere and Michael Manley, who were born in the interwar period. I'm, I make these distinctions, generational distinctions, because one, I think um, it's a, one, it's an intergenerational conversation, right? And these figures knew each other, were in conversation in political and intellectual networks through this period, but also it means that their experiences of what empire was and how to understand empire also changed because their formative intellectual and political experiences occurred at different moments. Um, so someone like uh, Du Bois gives us a language of talking about racial hierarchy. He's the one in 1900 who says the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of darker peoples uh, to the white nations, right? Um, that language will become very central to the ways in which later figures understand um, hierarchy, understand exploitation, and understand most significantly the role of race in structuring that world order. Um, the, the next two figures maybe I can talk about briefly, Kwame Nkrumah and Eric Williams, are both figures who are very influenced uh, by uh, uh, Marxist thought, uh, Nkrumah borrows from Lenin in particular, but also is mentored by a gener older generation of, of, of African and, and Caribbean intellectuals. And one of the, the contribution that I focus on for them is the ways that they make this argument that because there's all the, because the co colonial system is structured by economic dependence, um, um, we can't just have independence of states. Uh, we have to create a new political infrastructure that connects us in really co connects us to each other. Um, and their their vision of that takes the form of federation. So Nkrumah argues for a union of African states. Um, uh, Eric Williams argues for the West Indies Federation. I mean, one of the things just to bring in your article from this uh, from the latest issue of Sandwich is like the, the condition you describe in, in Africa where most trade is actually with the global north instead of in relation, Africans trading with Africans is precisely the condition that Kwame Nkrumah's vision of federation is meant to overcome, right? The idea that like he, he, he you know, this was a kind of central re reoccurring trope of this period of decolonization. Like if you wanna call Senegal from Ghana, your line is circuited through London and France before you you reach um, Dakar. Or if you want to travel, right, from one African country to another African country to go to Europe to come down. And so, the Federation was a way of like undoing those uh, relations of unequal relations and imperial relations with the global north and trying to create political and economic networks and infrastructures that connected African countries to each other or Caribbean countries to Caribbean countries. Then my last set of intellectuals, um, Julius Nerere and Michael Manley, um, they are really associated with this period of this project called the New International Economic Order. So they take power or uh, their, their most prominent contributions happen after these federation projects fail. And um, their key intervention is to imagine that the global order is, we ought to think about it as one economy. And we ought to think about the post-colonial states as as analogous to workers. Um, so their intervention is to say, are there ways to scale up the redistributive strategies of the welfare state and create a welfare world? Um, and again, here I think of very important resonances uh, with what you've written around um, 
around debt in the article, um, around also subsidies, the fact that global North countries have had subsidies for, for their agricultural products that prevents, undermines the capacity of post-colonial states to sell in those markets. This question of subsidies and protectionism on behalf of uh, global North states was a really central art set of debates around that during the new international economic order and our, an argument that those kinds of subsidies had to be um, uh, you know, abolished um, so that we could generate a, a more egalitarian world order. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with, with your assessment. And, and one of the ways I you often use it in the food system to think about this colonial decolonial relationship and a state of mind and the mind of a state of mind of coloniality that reside within our uh, <clears throat> bureaucrats uh, in the continent uh, in the last 40 years and how that enhance and, and, and def defeat the anti-colonial argument and enhance the new liberal project uh, that covered the African uh, continent and continue to do so. And I, and I found that you, your approach for us to asking the <clears throat> your reader to reevaluate, you know, uh, those history and to rewrite the history of anti-colonial and decolonial movements uh, in a present time in order to imagine the future, but also to assess the way in which the present in itself uh, it should be revealed. Like what type of a struggle that we should be struggling for if we want to emancipate Africa agricultural, for example, uh, sector out of the colonial relationships. Because as you very well aware that a can, any country or community cannot feed itself or have no sovereignty over its own food system is way, will be lacking its own political sovereignty. And, and so my, my question is, uh, how, how do you think that rewriting the narrative of anti-colonial struggle uh, will help us understand our aspiration for the future of global justice or the international order as you put it? And can you tell us more why that is important for our present moment? Like what, why we have to grapple with this something that's historical, that's far removed from us. What is the benefits and the importance of that? Yeah. Well, I think that, um, you know, past, present, future are deeply connected, right? We understand our present by understanding where we came from, and we can't plot our futures by not without a, a deep sense of where we've been and, and the kind of political struggles, the political failures also that have culminated in our particular moment right now. I think that's, that, that's broadly like as a, as a kind of political theorist, as a, someone who does history of ideas, that's the real reason I think, you know, I, I want to prioritize or privilege rewriting of history. I think though there's more kind of concrete things um, one could say about this too, which is, you know, um, like one is the language of decolonization has reappeared on our, you know, historic, in our present moment. Uh, we hear it on college campuses, decolonize the university, right? Uh, we hear it on in various kinds of struggles around reparations, around land claims. And I think in order to understand what the promise of that political project was, we have to kind of tell new histories about what figures wanted to achieve in the moment of decolonization. I think one of the things I find really striking is like how many of the conversations we're having now it um, are, are kind of uh, foreshadowed earlier, like we find their resonances of them earlier. So let's take something that's not really discussed in my book, like this debates about decolonizing the university, decolonizing curriculums. I mean, the African university is born out of this period of, of decolonization, right? This is the first moment where we get institutions of higher education. Almost immediately there's debates about what should be taught in these universities, how it should be taught. In the University of Ghana, for instance, starts an institute for African studies, right? As And then the argument is that we have to produce knowledge that helps us plot our own kind of political futures. Um, so I think, and, and also the figures I study are people who 
felt like even though they were political actors, like most of them are statesmen, uh, they become prime ministers, but they're all people who are deeply interested in the question of history and who think that writing histories of slavery or writing histories of empire um, can help them understand their own political predicament. So I think that's one lesson I wanna impart on kind of contemporary activists, organizers, people who are thinking about the contemporary demands of decolonization is that any attempt to stake out a political project of decolonization has to grapple with its past uses and it has to have an account of what empire is, what it is that we're trying to overcome through the project of decolonization. Um, I want to turn the question a little bit back to you, actually, and ask, you know, um, I think one, one way to tell the failure of, of course, the moment I described doesn't succeed, right, or it's only partially realized. And one might say that uh, like one limit of that moment was actually the, the very intellectual elites I talk about in my book, right? The statesmen um, who, who uh, for various reasons uh, either got co-opted or either, uh, you know, ended up becoming the, the engines of repressive and authoritarian regimes and institutes institu on the co on the continent, right? So it's not just that they didn't realize their dreams, but they ended up deploying the violence of the colonial state against their critics, etc. Right? This is, of course, what people would say say about someone like Nkrumah. Um, that's one critique of them. The second critique might be that. They actually, especially someone like Nkrumah, again, we'll talk about him, which might be different from other figures on the continent, were actually not preoccupied enough with the questions you are raising in your piece about food sovereignty, about the significance of the rural, right? These were figures who were preoccupied with the question of modernization, industrialization. Um, so I wonder what your assessment of that period of decolonization was what were some of the kind of failures of that project that have kind of led us to the context we're in now? Oh, for sure. No, I think it, it, it is valid questions and a very important one for our time. One of my observation around uh, the period, especially in the 1960s, you know, uh, and, and onward, that most of the nation building in, in the continent in general, with some few exceptions, that they weren't able, as Samira Min put it, to de-link their economic relation with the colonizer and metropolitan. And that's, that's inability to do so is, is put them in, in more challenging position as if uh, they kick the colonizer, but they borrow the whole entire blueprint of, of how to develop an state. And they've been more preoccupied by power itself more than building the state, which is a, is a, is a long project that required uh, uh, many years. And I also I want to just put a footnote here. You know, we have to keep in mind that the, the, the journey for African decolonization is only about, what, 50 years? So 60 years. It's not that long uh, journey in terms of uh, other nation history. I, uh, my earlier training in social movement took me to Latin America. So I stationed with the social movement in Colombia uh, toward, near the border with, with, uh, with Venezuela. And, and there I had a, an opportunity to reflect when I looked at the, the progress and the long journey of, 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 of social movement in those places from early 1800. Uh, to grapple with the question of, of liberatory projects, I reflect back to country like of my birth, like Sudan, for example, who gained independence in 56. I said, we are just really in infancy. Uh, and we need just always to remind ourselves that the project is, is kickstart, but crippled for uh, reasons that are obvious and not obvious, but we have the opportunity to use it to, to move that forward. And that will take me to the second point I wanna make that we need to think today about the importance of the South-South relationships. I mean, th those important raised in the 1950s in Bandung and et cetera, is remain vital to our liberatory projects. 
we can't think, I think the mistake that most of uh, leaders of independence made is to link their understanding of building nation or, or, or developing political project to the same idea of the empire that they've been fighting against. So they, they, wasn't a, they weren't able to imagine a future beyond the, the confinement of limitation of the nation state itself. And, and I think now we have a, a ripe opportunity to say, okay, now we know more, now we reflect more on this. Can we start rebuilding our civil society in particular, instead of just thinking about the, the echelon of power itself, in a way that allow us to understand and to converse about what those liberatory projects look like. And let's start with, for me, I never been trained as an agriculturalist. I trained just like you in political science, but I thought food system, one of the mega uh, uh, sector of industry, especially in the continent, but in generally global boor are more reside and work within the food system than any other sector, you know. Uh, almost close to between uh, 40 to 60 percent of our people work in those uh, in the sector of agriculture. So imagine if we liberate that space. Imagine if we have sovereignty of how people decide what to eat, how to eat it, where to eat it, and what to cultivate, and etc. And it does too many things. One is allow them to have sense of uh, abstract idea of sovereignty. Second, uh, we will be allowing them to live a different liberal standards as America Brown told us before in 1956. And thirdly, it will generate that sense of uh, interconnectedness that they could trade, Ethiopia could trade with Sudan, rather Ethiopia and England or Sudan and the US or, or, or going across uh, the oceans. So that's, those three things will re invigorate the conversation about, we have so much to gain if we robusted the South-South relation or intercontinental relation. And, and, and finally, that also will be the road for space for intellectual exchange. But what is <clears throat> unified Africans uh, versus what relationship we do have with, with Europe? Uh, and I'm big proponent of delinking. Delinking doesn't mean we have uh, to stop our relationship with the, with the, with the, uh, with the globe, but actually to start it from a point of strength, like how the continent could develop. You know, like you said, I remember one day I want to visit Rwanda and I really have to travel to Germany in order to get to Rwanda. And I, I could drive just from Sudan to Rwanda, but it, of course it's impossible and it's too expensive, time consuming. And I was so upset. I said, people tell us we live in both colonial world. This is the colonial world. So, so with that, I, I will give you uh, the opportunity if you have a-, a, a Yeah, I a mean, lot. I think one of the, um, I'm really glad you mentioned Samir Amin, um, of like towering uh, African intellectual. We, we just lost a few years ago. And really the, the delinking idea is so central. I mean, one thing to say about Samir Amin is he was a deep critic of the new international economic order because he was like, this aspiration for equality, you know, it, even, if, if, even if Europe and America dropped all their agricultural subsidies and you were able to trade with them, it's not gonna solve the fundamental problem of structural inequality, right? The fact that you that, that Africa is in peripheral states. And I think you're right also that the idea of delinking has been so associated with a form of um, autarky or like a closed economy that doesn't mean, you know, that there isn't other forms of trade. But of course, Samir Amin was an advocate as others were of South-South relations and of developing more uh, egalitarian ways of relating to each other um, on the continent and across other other global South states. Um, I also just want to say I think one of the most important things about uh, your emphasis on food sovereignty that comes out in the article too is um, that this is a moment of climate crisis and the question of food, of how we're going to feed ourselves, 
is such an important one. Um, and it, you know, th that I think like the fact of the climate catastrophe that we are in the midst of really has to be taken so very seriously by any kind of contemporary project of decolonization. It's the one thing that makes our moment so different from the, like radically different from the horizons of possibility in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and as you also put it in the article, this partly this is why there's like all this land grabbing happening, especially in the in the our our region of the Horn of Africa, right? Uh, by states in the Middle East and 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 other players by India too. Um, uh, and so the the question of kind of food sovereignty, I think, is really central. Um, Maybe we can end with one last thing, which is where do you see, I mean, we've seen over the last couple of years in Sudan, uh, last in the summer or like in the fall in Nigeria, a few years ago in my homeland of Ethiopia, you know, a resurgence of popular mobilization um, on um, across the African continent. So I wonder how, where do you see signs of political possibility on the continent? Uh, what are you most hopeful about in this moment? I'm, I'm, I'm so glad before I jump into your, your question, you brought the, the climate crisis vis-a-vis uh, -vis our you know, future political engagement. I think uh, for us in the continent, this to grapple with the idea of the uh, climate crisis is so essential, uh, it's so essential into so many levels. But if we stick with agriculture, we know that agriculture contributes to almost 26% of the global gas, uh, green gas emissions. So, and imagine that, and we being pushed again to adapt and to work within, uh, otherwise is a is acceptable framework for achieving sustainable development goals. But the way in which the mechanism of that is so alienating our, uh, our people and continent from the natural world that we, we, we inhabit it. And if we follow a uh, suit of, of, of China's or India's green revolution, the catastrophe will be immense, not only of, on the continent, but also uh, in the humankind. So I think grappling with the idea of, of thinking about food sovereignty deeply as, as a one response to hunger, but is also a response to the climate crisis. And you know, I, I don't need to say that, but m m most of the audience know that always the most marginalized, the most oppressed will call urban to save the world oftentimes, not the other way around. So, and, and, and to answer your questions, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful of the future of, of, uh, of, of popular mobilization in, 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 in the continent, in the, con in, in the sense that they did not this time as I follow it closely, they did not focus only in political change. Their quest was for racial equity, for gender equity, for the right of LGBTQ, for the environmental uh, uh, sustainability, for, for food, uh, for equity between rural and urban. And for me, uh, I looked deeply in the popular uprising in Sudan, for example, and I noticed that when I interview some of this new generation, all of them under 30, I, I was shocked by their capacity to say there is a broad structural problem in the country. It's not only just the leaders. It, we have to overhaul the whole entire uh, apparatus of, of, they call it the deep state, but what they meant when you discuss it with them, this is a structural problem that contribute to poverty, poor education, health, etc., and lack of opportunity. And even they discuss the idea of forced migrations. So I was really impressed and, and, and I found it really profound. And, and I took some trip in the uh, uh, west side of the continent from, from Senegal to uh, Burkina Faso. And I saw almost the same kind of sentiment of how people uh, grounding themselves in very practical issues of agroecology, for example. And, and, and reality there, I decided to work in the food system. When I met this woman, we are the solution. I said, this is an opportunity for us to reframe even our political project. So my hope in, in, in the popular movement I see across 
uh, the continent, they always center not about a singular issue, but about the structural issues. And I think it's about time to go back to the structural issues that it's not who is in power, but actually what political project and political program actually leads uh, uh, to Ashalan of power. Well, I think that's just such a great place for us uh, to close this conversation because, um, you know, in some ways, I think like both the, uh, the work of your article in the magazine and what I've tried to do in my project is to, to center the African continent as the space and site of political innovation to be like this is not a place just of the world's catastrophes right uh the world's miseries but a place and space of generativity uh and creativity and um precisely the kind of new energies coming out of youth mobilizations the fact that such a large percentage of the of the continent's population is now under 30 um I don't know, also leaves me with a great sense of political possibility um, and the, the kind of range of projects that people are taking on politically, culturally um, are, are just fascinating. And I think also that this, ex this magazine is also a, an, an example of that kind of creativity, right? And the, the possibilities that can come to the fore when we speak to each other across the continent and and share stories, share food, right? Share resonant experiences across the continent. So it's been really fun to talk to you um, today. It's a real, real pleasure, Adam, and I hope that we continue to engage and across, you know, the Atlantic with our uh, people in the diaspora. And by that, I mean the continent and the Caribbean and part of Asia. Uh, and of course, here in, in, in the United States, uh, the work is immense, but the hope is unbelievably uh, uh, greater. So thank you and uh, talk to you soon. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. For 400 years, in fields, kitchens, taverns, and businesses around the country, African Americans have shaped our national culinary identity. We see the legacy everywhere. Rice, whiskey, ice cream, sugar, supermarkets. And yet these stories, for the most part, have gone unrecognized. I'm Dr. Jessica B. Harris, and I'm the lead curator on the next exhibition from the Museum of Food and Drink, African slash American, Making the Nation's Table. I'm Uzad Dima'iwala, the CEO of the Africa Center. The Africa Center is excited to host the nation's first major exhibition celebrating African-American contributions to American cuisine. At the Africa Center, we are radically reimagining the stories and structures shaping the lives of people of African descent in Africa and around the world. Through our programs and exhibitions, we're engaging partners who wish to deepen their connections with the African continent by finding unity with and within the global African diaspora. That's why we're thrilled to partner with the Museum of Food and Drink on the upcoming exhibition. The Museum of Food and Drink is a new kind of museum that brings the world of food and drink to life with exhibits you can taste, touch, and smell. MOFAD uses food as a powerful lens to create cultural change towards a more thoughtful, caring, and delicious future. Yum. African slash American Making the Nation's Table centers on the stories and skills of Africans who came to America and their central role in developing the agricultural, culinary, and hospitality systems that fuel the American economy today. Africans were enslaved with knowledge of their specific farming skills. In South Carolina, plantation owners capitalized on enslaved labor from what is now known as the Grain Coast of Sierra Leone, Senegal, and the Gambia. West Africans cultivated an indigenous form of rice that was already an established crop on the continent long before the transatlantic slave trade. In South Carolina, enslaved Africans faced grueling conditions to produce Carolina gold rice, one of the world's most coveted export crops. By 1720, enslaved Africans produced more than 20 million pounds per year, making South Carolina the richest of the 13 colonies. This is just one of the many ways in which people of African descent have played a central role in developing the systems that continue to fuel the American economy. 
Once COVID is further behind us, we look forward to welcoming you to the exhibition in person. I can't wait to see you here. It's time to recognize the countless black chefs, farmers, and food and drink producers who have laid the foundation for what we all eat and drink as a country. The first thing you see when you enter the exhibition will be an 18 foot by 30 foot legacy quilt. This will be a stunning work of art composed of 400 handcrafted blocks, each one representing one contribution made by an African American. Visitors will see in one massive object the sheer breadth of the story. We are restoring the Ebony Magazine Test Kitchen. It is this extraordinary, psychedelic, <laughs> orange day glow place that not only tested recipes but it was a place that was a nucleus for a changing of african-american cuisine the grand finale for the exhibition will be a guided tasting we're working with an extraordinary lineup of chefs to create tastings that will bring visitors together around the table to break bread share stories and make new connections it's about time in fact, it's past time. But clearly now is the time to celebrate, to savor, and to remember African-American food is American food. So the next thing is a reading from the magazine by Yemisi Aribisala. She's an excellent writer, and excellent because, at least in my mind, she creates words, phrases, expressions that don't care about where the reader is coming from, but just about how she thinks things sh uh, should be said. And so in, in editing her piece, um, um, Ruth and I, we were just like constantly finding new phrases and new expressions and just being marveled by them um and so we, we decided to have her read the piece yeah it's such a like word luxury piece like there's so many so many great phrases and particular to her just style of writing um so do you want to talk about the art direction for, oh yeah. sure so what the footage you'll see um while yamasi is reading her piece is a uh, market in, in Lagos on the mainland um, shot by our, one of the videographers we work with, Light Orie. So I just wanted to sort of create some chaos, some of the chaos she speaks about in her piece about markets. Um, sh hers is in London. And, and the footage was accidental? Yeah, it was accidental footage. He left his camera on while he was walking around in the market, but I thought it was quite perfect. Yeah. Yeah, so do enjoy it. My first time. That winter evening while I was walking down Peckham Rye Market Street in London, at shoulder bump, squeeze past pace, a man screamed, Shaki! at me. It was in one of those brisk sections of the market where South Asians sell a variety of fresh meat and you don't need to strain to hear Yoruba words splicing through the mishmash of street sounds. Those same parts of Peckham Rye I walked that evening are two decades later referred to as Little Lagos. I had just gone past a window full of pristine pink chicken parts contrasting white tiles on the walls of the shop. When the word bounced off the back of my head it was much too incongruous for the context. So I didn't respond, I hurried away. If I was walking down Sura Market Road on Lagos Island, Nigeria, fine, I might have turned around as if Shaki was my name, as if it isn't what we call a part of the anatomy of a cow in southwestern Nigeria. I was in South London for goodness sake, 5,020 kilometers away from home. And the man behind me calling out had a Pakistani accent. My mind easily persuaded me that I had heard wrong. Of course he couldn't be speaking Yoruba. The man persisted. Shaki, you want Shaki? 
He swathed after me for a bit, as if he knew me well, and wasn't in the least bit dissuaded by my refusal to acknowledge him. I stole a quick look to identify a butcher's apprentice in a stained coat. His presumption that I understood him while being totally random was spot on. I am Nigerian. I have an infatuation for the half-inch thick third chamber of the cow's stomach called the Omasum, as thick as a Bible. Not for spruced up tripe, politely swathed in cellophane, apologetically labelled OFO and tucked in the refrigerator of nose-to-eat tail-eating specialty shops. The stuff that gets boiled with milk and onions. Ugh. I'm talking about slow, long-boiled, stewed with lots of pepper, shaki, served with basmati rice. The shaki that I am passionate about is not the same as the pre-boiled, bleached for a week sheets that Londoners call tripe. I know this complicates the conundrum of meat-eating compromises that Nigerians make while living in London. We keenly appreciate that Londoners believe that their treatment of and decisions on meat are at the pinnacle of civilised butchering and echo meat eating. I haven't eaten in a restaurant in London since moving back over two years ago because of the omnipresence of a kind of global plate that satisfies a global palate. Such a plate is trendy, aromatically restrained, overtouched, smudged, smeared, reduced, foamed, minuscule portions. I'm told I have to be excited about eating from that plate when I want a large white bowl with hot, peppered, aromatic puddles. The most racy thing I have ever seen on a restaurant plate as a non-dining observer of London restaurants is marrow bone with a fat slouched tantalizingly inside. You would imagine you can suck and get away with it. You wouldn't want to dare. The fact that you must do a double take on what to do is all that needs to be said on the matter. I find the texture of London tribe wretchedly diminished by dressing. The process of dressing isn't expounded upon. Is that bleach or something else you can smell on the meat? The real proposal that London tribe makes is that I ought to be reassured by inorganic cleanliness rather than the original aroma of the meat. I am uneasy with the determination to soften meat by any means possible. I will take the gaminess of meat any day over the smell of bleach. Furthermore, the butcher's peeling strips off character. I see plenty of tripe as smooth as cloth. They are as appealing as eating cloth. I never see the kind that has thick lining with tendrils and fat, no diamond-shaped corrugation. I realize my kind that loves undressed beef shaki don't constitute a significant market in Little Lagos. The point of sale of shaki in Lagos, Nigeria, offers such a wonderful contrast it is perhaps evocative of shambles in old world London. Encrusted bowls of water balanced on tables with soaking rolls of bomo, cow hide, bokoto, cow's hooves, pleated intestines. All first class delicacies, thank you. There will be sounds of hacking of bones with machete in the vicinity of humid aisles where slippery blood is underfoot, the smell of warm guts, sourness and gastric acid will distend the air. The shaki for sale might be black with polka-dotted frills, beige with raised squares, 
cream and simply ridged, brown, tense and obnoxious and looking like it wants to fight. It will never be white nor tear easily under pressure of fingers. No Nigerian with common sense will buy that kind of tripe. Contrary to the northern hemispherical conclusion that tender meat is darling, white is right, bland is civilized, sterile is respect, protracted rumination is savagery. Meat in Lagos markets is unhung, slaughtered and sold quickly under the mining of Arabic prayers and drained of blood. You need to rush the shaki home in a bowl to catch the dripping perfume that will never wash out of your car mat in a year. You get home and wash the shaki with concentration, hands picking carefully, sometimes scraping with a knife between inspected tendrils for grains of sand and digested food. You peel sparingly. You leave on fat for flavor and discard it later with the boiling water. You cut into small pieces. Boil for about three hours with bay leaf and fresh ginger root. You change and throw the boiling water away at least once. You don't start to cook the stew until the shaki crunches and splits when you bite down on it. You stew the shaki with other parts of beef, shing, brisket, shank. You simmer long and lovingly till the bones of brisket squish savory sweetness and become what we call biscuit bone. Your shaki is cooked when it yields almost gelatinously to biting, when it pulls away slightly, threads slightly, sliding easily without sticking in your teeth, not disturbing the chewing of grains of steamed rice with it. Meat is not something Nigerians are neurotic about. We love it and consider its presence a sign of good living. Therefore, it needs long attendance and staying power in the mouth. It needs spices. It needs pepper. Sometimes we fry beef till each thread of the meat stands alone. Rumination is fundamental. As a Nigerian writer living in London and sometimes writing about food, you must often keep the resolute straight-faced stride in the opposite direction from the primal call of meat to answer the call of shaki with an enthusiastic yes is to admit you are savoring those parts that people conclude self-righteously belong to a troglodyte stable. Tribe eating went out with war eating with the 1950s and the closing of a famous chain of awful shops in Lancashire. It is so much the stuff of nostalgia on food rationing and controversial meat love that the celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay created a memorable moment on television when he cooked it in 2007. People still refer back to that television program as if they are talking about revolution. When I see food writer colleagues in 2020 post photographs online of eggs with apologies to vegan friends, I feel, I feel every thread in the kilometers between markets. I think about love and self-consciousness, dressing up and laying bare private rooms of the mouth. Deviled eggs, biblical shaki, and all the worlds and civilizations between. This is a conversation between uh, Ireti and Mrs. Bola Badebo. So, uh, Ireti is a friend, she's also a writer and does communications work. 
and she lives in Lagos and she has a, a domestic worker generally I think they're called house helps in, yeah. in, in Lagos anyway she has a domestic worker and we've every and I have these conversations about labor and just the relationship between labor and money and, and um, how she feels hiring somebody who is older than her and paying and, and paying for um, her services and um, so we decided to have Iriti write in the magazine about um, just all the different kinds of domestic labor that she that is connected to food that she is um, that she can tell a story about and so she wrote this really wonderful story that is devastating at the end uh, but it's a beautiful story um, and then for for this digital event we we had her in conversation with um mrs bola we she's called mommy michael in the story yeah, yeah. she's referred to as mommy michael but that's... she's referred to she's referred to as mommy michael period because that's her appellate appellative yeah. is that what's the word something like yeah <laughs> um but yeah, I think the, they have the conversation. The conversation in Yoruba is subtitled, and they mostly talk about you were there. I, I yeah, wasn't there. it was it was a really great conversation, and maybe one they typically wouldn't have unless the setting was was like the premise was set up as such. And they talked about um, other employees, other employers of Mummy Michael, and um, what her experience is like working for someone who's younger than her. Um, what sort of yeah what sort of what her experience is like doing this work period yeah yeah. I think the biggest thing to realize is like Nigeria and I'm sure a lot of African countries but just African communities are really um, class and status conscious so if you think of class as having access to wealth and status as having access to um i guess respect in the community so status is usually based on your age or your achievements but there's been this like clash or, or uh, fracture because of the sort of like capitalist um society that we're in that has disrupted um this relationship and so the emphasis on on the age difference between uh, between mommy michael and iriti is because of the um, like historical um, significance given given to status in you know Yoruba culture, given to age, but then this injection of capital and capitalism in that relationship disrupts it, and so you have people who are older working for people who are younger, and there's this like general um, you know sometimes disrespect, sometimes abuse. So all this is explored class and status. Yeah. Oh, enjoy it. <laughs> So in Bati, um in Bati if I cook so funny pay mwa to cook bonny pie shay. Okay. The first time they're me. Obviously te ba te te on ba wo yo mama e your money idea um kilo yo kini age. Your money idea or uh jewelry e jewelry any in ba terri me but if I so funny pay is ni pai shay first time te cook or me killer ru especially ni pa i jewelry me ikojore <laughs> Mm. So, understand 
ti ba ti e fe berin kan lowo eni to ba ja gbalagba ru a ma ba mi lati bere pe ti ah eni da gbalagba gbalagba leni yin pe bi mo se berin kan lowo won pe ki ko ba ti mo ti tan na se pe pe ki won ma wo pe ki free pe ko se awon ni o pe mi ni wa la emi na kan mi da le ti ba le ngba e so o ronrun lati especially ti won ba fe bi nkan lowo oga to je pe o yato si nkan te ti jo agree pe bi se mo bi ki osu ma ti tan ke fe gba owo boya e ni de abi ke fe gba iye pe eni le wa ni jo kan irun kan be yen so se en so pe won ran lati be irun kan be yen lowo eni to ba si iyo ohun ju agbalagba lo mm nti mi kan ro nipa e na iye na wa lara e but nti mi de to ro nipa e ni pa pe agbalagba ni pe agbalagba mi wa ngba e ti pe te ba ba won sise te ba ba won sise pe boya fe gba yi Mm. But am I we boya ah boya mo ni boya mo ni party kan tun so pa ah mo mi o mo fe lo party kan pe kini kan am I we ah awon o se mo ri pe awon awon dagba ni ke ise to wa se pe ola nse fe si se awon ala fe ko pa bi ah mi ni fun e laye o aye je kan mo fun e mi fun laye ojo meji o but ba ye pe n to to kere ti ba gba mo fe se kini ni okay ma e ma le ma le mo ni ma ni je get fide okay the first time te fe bere on ko be yen boya e le wa njo yen o abi se mo ko su ma ti ton ke fe gba kini bawo lo se bawo le se leru ko ma lo ke to be ke to bi mi bawo de le se lo ki le ki bawo lo se lo ngba te bi mi mm da ti mo bi yin gba e odun na gba e gba e ti mo fe bi yin gba e mo ko so fa ti fe pe a pe mo fe so bawo fun be mo fe bere owo ko yan ni ah an de ni awon odasi o pe ko se le to ka pe ah pe kin bere na ni o kin se eyan ti ni o le face na pe kin lo na mo de loki o mo de inu mi de lo pe jo ti mo bi e je ti je ki so pe eni ki ma wo ri pe ma fun me ma fun mi pe e de fun mi gba but emi na de n de mu pe e fun mi gba kun bi a ara kan ti mu mu so pe mu like na ni em se mo pe okay nkan ti mo be rin si em en sise fun eyan me lo bai eyan meta bai meta emi abi the second person ojo ori e e fun mi like die mm ojo ori e ni e na bi boya bi o e bi keji ti mo ba sise ye mm an ti mo ba se diriru ye na mm to wa ni kin ko jori boya bi ojo re le ju boya bi 28 okay so bi emi na eh ko le ju 28 then eh mama to wa ni magodo magodo okay eh mi ya magodo ya ya ma ti ma lo bi 60 60 okay she so our marriage abi ta ni be ta je bi the same age ati mama yen ya to si nkan ta so nipa te yan ba fe gba ye nkan kan kini awon iyato to wa ninu ke ma ba bi eyan bi temi sise abi ke ma ba mama magodo yen sise ki la won iyato te ma notice ti mo notice nbe okay to yato ni la rin yin e eh yato se mi kan ri nbe ni pe ru eyin mejeje en sin mo free nbe lo do la rin mejeje but mama e mi o free nbe le se pe ya mi o ki se mi o free lo do won o e pe di we ti ma ye se si yin nbe pe a se pe singu fun e mejeji e mi le se ba e fun mama e eh eh ro re re ti ma ba odun ma ba mi se gba mi ma ni kin joko pe gba mi ti ma pa ri ma ni kin ma lo le ma na kin ba won se re die mi ni le ba won se re be mi se ba le ba be mi se free ma eyin mejeji eh so ma mo kan ma ni ma mi o ti re mi je kin ma lo le won dan pe mi fe mi da pa won agbala gba pe mama pe ah kin mi fe ma ba won so ma ni ma mi o ti re mi je kin ma lo le pe o ti re mi jare ma de ma lo le se iya to kokan tun wa bi eh bo se ma eh bo se ma tete so won yin to bi ise to ma iye ise to ma fun yin irun kan be eni ki la won iya to wa iya to ni mo ri mama magode yen sin ara bi agbalagba ti mo so na ni mama magode bi o su kejo ba ti wo bi on the 15 ko ni san ko ni san wo mo ni san wo ye tin ba de o da ngba mi gan on the 15 gan on the 16 ba mi tin ba bere Ah, on les pass of mi pe ya okan lo ma san ti pe ki lo ba daji ba mi n ba de tan pe daji pe mami ni pe ma no ja ni pa pe eh awon kin awon kin transfer owo pe mami ni kin lo ba won sa ma n ti mi sira won so ta re je ti mo wa pe omo won pe pe mo ni mi like bi awon meji se n ti mi sira won pe ba mi on the 60 on the 15 na san owo fun mi so omo ya pe pe ki ma ku ma ba won soro won sa ba won soro ni last year but still na won change won change lati ma san wo ye ti se ye na and ise ye po lodo won na ti mo ba won se ju todo yin lo dada because won je agbalagba emi de ma wo pe 
Okay. Um, Igbati, Sharon Okay. <laughs> The next street, the street, because I see all the one, and my good night, or street to your town loop. And so I test here for me. One song, one song, nine thousand, and so even nine thousand. The letter, but my dinner, and I came, I'm up with me, my nipple. So, I'm up with one. I want to be up, but you might be no account to me, you pay out to buy resort here, because it's a problem. We are not if you want daddy pay, we will test him with a cocoa, with a problem, pay more free pay, king, but I just more calls me, but I call for some loss of test here. So that Kin <laughs> We store in the kitchen and we want to get sassy. Yara, I'm so sassy. No, 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 yara, I'm so sassy. She money my bar, and when she share by be a agbalagba. You miss a book or Miss Arrow, Miss Bock or one. Ah, that you any help me. We are to bat the tongue. I'm batting my tongue. We are the mallow's office. One in my mother, when you die, Mom is a la and no one you could see while I be tested. Timmy teaching and announcing the king. Dodge people, but that is that you fake Mushi Wally, a public is a test taking to the war. It to the Wally. She obosh is a lane, bay, and she a ball lets him feel a bee. But Thomas, I have me back to the test, and the king eyed, Mamma. But to die, you go to my commissary test, that's a good move, Wally. Waking my work, you are like the look, and the Wally. No, but more the delegate must have come in the crowd, yet and ran it, be as she bears near the queer, waking the mummy, one mean. Money, but most of whom, talk much of me, and the queer, came out, Wally. That you're king, Wally, let me see test, women that is a test, see, that very well, what you're lonely. La won se so pe kin sa pa mo pe awon te fe kin ba won kin le je kin to lo mo ni pe okay se wo san ijo yen ijo yen lo so wo ye no ijo yen te so ijo yen te ni pe ko ti ye ke bere ni ti ye kin bere se ise te se ni ijo yen so san wo e won san wo e wo san wo e won san wo e then te ba wo iye ton so fun yin si at segbe si ise yen te ba wo won pelu ise yen si ti temi abi ti elin teni to tu to ti je bi age bent mi se ba o lo se ri mm ah ise won se ju o se ju o tan yen mu gba lowo o ise ti mo se nbe o po ju to do yin lo dada because ba mi gan ni kitchen mo lo more than 4 hours ni kitchen ni kan ni kitchen ni kan ni kitchen ni kan ah 
Munu to more than one hour. Or Jotty, that was in the Tanipe, Tons of Mipe. Ah, Jot Mokober, Slim of Bound for Betru. Tanipe, I told me King Wall door, Yala wine. I want back King Job, the Cato Sordu, where King Jopay Yala picked my bound for Betru, my one. Ah, or Joy, old lag barra, King Tokuru and Bear Jay. Be baby to seven. Eh? Not see be after it, Moti David to seven. Mudan, she said it to seven, any. Or Joy, old lag barra. Tell me, Barry shall lay it on. And make be just the true one at the Yala when they come back to move by. Ah, we are between at my lobby, be a two year twenty four last. Ah, ah, mom, or they be paid. I put more tuna, Timotin Lo, I put your tongue, Anthony Kisai Lora, Sashet, I put Mosa before. Mosa, Mosa bound for more for to pay in fact. He said to Mosa enjoy it. But Mosa Gano and Gantu when you pay up, try. Or just the next week, my father law. So that you want or come up for many two thousand pay. Mamma, so I'm bound for the year in Betro Mona Ben. So that you want to pay that in the count for me two thousand. So I dare, you are wonderful for me, pay on the new one shield. You pay the setting bound and say no betroom in Betroom. Once I saw my equipment, money betroom, you did or did you want to pay me my one quick? I won't pay for put them back on two pounds, they 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 put them back on two pounds, me le pa mi kin ja kan mi ja kan pa pe be ti do ti kan kin kan ba won se pa meta ko do to de na se ni kin ba won fo pe mi le pa won dan ni agbara ti ma se ru se ba ye mo ah so to ba iru ijo te so pe e ti se di 7 fun ire eyan be yen ati fun ati ma sise fun fun ire eyan be yen ati boya e tin sise fun won na o wa so fun yin ke se biruru bathroom e to je pe boya ti se di 5 o'clock lo se so pe ke se bathroom se fi o pe le so pe rara pe e se mm ba je pe awon ni mo ba sise ti mo de wa si mo de wa nbe enjoy e tan ba ni kin se ma si ma si tan ba ni kin se ma si e le ko se fun mi le ko se fun to rojo e na mo ti se tan gan jo e na wa ni pe kin jo kin ba won si bathroom awon mo de wo be mo de lo Mbari kia kwe beye do ti gan, to re rutu mo kuja de gan be, ki se kikiri. Che e ro kwe e le so kwe e si se fun yro yon ben yon. Ye ye mi si se fun yon ma bi. Che to ri se yon to kpo. Pe i se yon kpo, wo kin te te son wo, o wo ton son nan o ton kan. I ben yon e jin nan. O jin nan. E nan, fun yon yon nan mo le so kwe mi yon si se fun yon ma. Fun yon, 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 Tambanson, what about some way of me last you could? Oh, yes, ma'am. But a hermit and Lima, a joke, a ma farati, ma for a pool, a ma for it to be, ma ma bawan shillo. Tambanson last you could for me, ma ma bawan see. Clearly, tea, the one by me sorrow. As a man, a man low air, a man so ma. Clearly, there's a man so ve. Mumma low air for me, a mamma look bad for me. And oh, ne, two of months so be. Ni tava ni kawo ti ni ti kocho ni ti yoba. Hmm. Bo si e kori ni e. Kilo de? Eh eh. Di ni wipe. Ka ka ba so pi ti we si. Ka pi ba ba bi ati yoba. Bo si e kori ni. Di ni wipe. Yoba ma so pe. Eh. Ento ba fun yon lo nje. Ento ba fun yon lo nje. Pe oba e nyan ni. Pe bak pe jolo e nyan ni. Bo si pe ni e si le kuku kere to. Kene ba e. Because. Bosi bosi pe ya mo ba yin sise gan ba pe ya bi abi office in lagan kan ni boya bi any company ti ma ba yin sise nbe ya to family kan o gbodo ri be because en to ba ti en to ba ti san wo fun yan o si bo fi ro ke ni ya ko kire to o si bo re ko ni ko je eyan gbodo fun ni respect e but she e ma ro pe se ko kin ko kin ba o lo se ma je ke yin feel ba o lo se ma so pe ba o lo se ma je ba o le se ba le yin se ro pe se mo eni to to sanwo fun yin e to sanwo fun yin o so si kere si yin ati ma lo eyan ba o lo se ma je ke se ko kin ko kin ni la e ko kin ni lara ko kin je ke ke ma ro ba kan ko ri ba kan si yin ayo ko ri ba kan si mi o because bo se mo ma mo ma se fun gbogbo yan generally e mo se gba ti mo sise ni ta nse ni e popun gba e gan ta wa nbe nbe mi sase mun to je pe kin ni gan gba e tin ke ma e gan complain gba e na mun ni ah bo se ye bo ai pe le yoba bo se ye ko ri ni yato fun gba ile yoba na eni bo to ba ti sanwo fun yan ko da ko ma ju kekere ko si be ni e se le ko je ko kere si ko kere to yan gbodo fun ni respect 
Okay, she mo kwe awon yoba, especially am yoba la medeji. She mo kwe especially for bini ati ma shisha ele ati ma eh eh ati ma dano ati ma nule ati bo 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 yoba number one what believe kwe ishe obiri ni what do believe kwe be iyi lo je for bini lati she bo bo kini eh lati ma she kara kara. So mo wo kwe be she je yoba medeji she je yoba ti e je mba mi shisha ele. Ba o le se ro pe ba o le se wo pelu bi yoruba se ma te mo ti mo je mi o ti dagbalagba okay mi o kan lo pa mi o se so se e kin ro pe ah se o mo lo abile nkan to sai ni pe eh mi o kin ro ki an de tun ro idi ni wi pe nto fi awon yoba fun ma so be ni wi pe eh pe to a ma fi se le ko obinrin be to ba mari to ba te lo si ile oko e se n bayi pe awon yo ma so pe gbo nkan ko lowo ma nse pe to ba te lo si ile oko e pe ti si joba ni mo ko ko fe so fun je to je ba si ma so be nkan ma fi se ko bere pe to ba lo si ile oko e boya a so ni o abi boya ti sise ile o ko ni ni lara lati sise ye boya bi mo se ba sise nsin boya ti ba ko ko dede disappoint yin ti mi so fun pe mi ni wa for second ti mi dede wa se pe ati sare re lo mi Only share the second thing. Ah, me kuku gela pa me gela se. She be kiti forbo me ni. Ben ma bi forbo. Se kwe abo ye ma is lati for. Nti onfi ma se kuku abo ni ma ko. I share ni. Oku ni ma de te kwe abo ni ma mari. I don't go for more though. Be oni ko ma she. I share ye. But to ba ma ni pa share ye she. O ma affect ye. Ole je koko mi mi ko ma ya ni. Abi ko. Hello, my family. Eh eh. Abi kam abi. Onfi oku ni te ni ye je kwe. Bo no onfi ya wo. On the bottom of the floor, but I'm not going to go for more. I'm 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 going to go for more. Aye ta wa yin se ki la ma npe computer e ji ni computer la computer ha ki ni la wa live la wa nsi pe ni si pe e pe ni sa won ni se inu agaga yin guys ki se pe elomi o le da na but elomi o fe wa la lati fun re ni wa la mi ya pe ni pe ti o ba owo ba wa lati san wo fa won to ma se won aba won aba se eru wa won mo si ya mo gbo de pe mo ni visible si to ni to won ma tele won ma te bo ni o ni to kan won an ya believe pe tan na ba mari o bi de ni gbogbo won but an believe ya won na da believe tan ba mari bo se wa e gbogbo ti won tan so pe boya won won yo lo se kini je ko li jo le fun won because won afo wo se mm ti bayi won ibe se kan ma se pe nigeria gan won afo wo se so bi pe boya pe boya eyan won pe boya eyan kan jo le pe eyan ati pe ati fo wo se de le kini e de tun e pa won eyan Nee bai, mo se lo mi ti o si ni se lowo, ibe mi si mi je pe se ti mo se nsin. E mo ba nsise, mo ba lo mi se je pe o ti ye emi ti mu gege gbe pe ise ti mi niye. Ise ti mo se niye. To ba si pe bo iru nkan ba ye wa ye, pe pe iru nkan ba ye wa ye. Mo so awon ti o ni se lowo ti o ka ti o ni se wole. Ise ile o le wa ye lati ti fun wa. Hmm. Ma be lo si ba dagba, abi aburo yin abo abo mo yin obirin. To ba ka ka yo ti ta ba yo ti se kuro nbi e. Kuro nu e. Fun ero okan yin gangan se o ma te yin lorun ki omo yin obirin ababuro yin obirin ko lo wo e ko ma gba yan lati se ise yan abi e ma ni pe e ma prefer ko ko mo lara ko kan se ni pe to ba to ba lo wo e to ba fe se mo le gba laye lati je ko se nti o kan se le ni pe o ma je ki nti o se ni pe nti mi kan ma so fun ni nti mi kan ma ko ni pe ma ma ko si ni pe kini yi o to ba do ti won ma nfo ni gbe boya boya ta so ba do ti o bi se pe wa ma wa pa ti wa tun mu mi wa fo tori to na ba to ba to ba to ba daba to ba lowo ti o ba gba yan si se boya eni eni en ba fo aso ta so yo ba mo a le complete pe ah mo mi aso te fo yi ya ba nti aso te fo yi aso yo mo o mi da po mo pe o ye po o ye po se ni ba ba pe ti o mo ni pa pe eh boya bi a bi le ba do ti yi o ko worry ko se le to kan ma ba ba gbe yan ta ba se gan ba yan ba gbo bo afo gan se ta yan ye gba pa se bo ba se wu gan ba ba se won fun pe o wa na fe gba 
ko ni mai ani kan sa si kan ma lo ko to ba ti mo ni pa kini ye aba ni ah ma mi e gba bi bayi bi bayi e gba bi bayi ni ti o bi bayi o ni ti e pe o fe ni tinez fure o de fu wo ra ni so won de gboro ba an de gboro ba se so to ma mo bi ni ba ni owo to ba lo n fe se ru e o fi lati se o fi lati se because ni gba e a wa ma n ro pe ni gba ni gba awon mama ro pe bi ati e ba si se le ti e ba si se ri pe kini kan pe kini kan o tu ma o tu ma n fun awon mo si ni pe o tu ma n je pe bi a po tu fe fa aisan si won lara se bayi bi e lo mi lo si bi se lati ya ro o de o de la go marun aba go mera aba go mefa o ti de boya ko to lo la ro ko le fobo ninu sink o rush lo bi se ni o de o fu abo bo se n fu abo e na o gbo je kana ko de so po n gbo je kana gan elomi gan le to re gan o je to bi kana o le sun lo ku gba le sun lo o to ni to ba to ba ti re but to ba se pe bo se lo bi se ye boya n to ma ba se ni ewi tabi lo sa bo gba yan abo gbo modo sile o ba lo ya mo pe se e lo ma face en to ma face ile o ma wa fun ti yo gbo ba se dada so fi pe isin kan ti mo gba eyin fun ni ele because en tan gbe mi fun le mi na se ta o to ni se mo pe tele o to de ni se mo pe tele awon igba ti awon mama ti wa kiki obirin o de ma tele je ko obirin tete gbo mhm 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 she ma she ma gba so to ni se mo ke tele i want i want awon ko ma so pe elomi e ma te ba fi roro yi lo ani kilo ni ale wo ni pe obirin se ma se kini so ba o le se ro pe owo owo ni ni se ma affect gugu awon asa se mo ke tele to ba je bi 30 years ago te so fun yan pe eyan bi temi fe ma gba eni e ma elomi ma so pe wo ni ba o le se ro pe owo se ma affect gugu awon asa ta ma nro pe ah a le ye lai lai asa eh e won mo so pe boya o le je ki a ki to wo le se abi en te so ko be ko e mm ni asa yu yu se tin ba eh mo o ke tin ba so tin ba so gbolowo yin pe ko si asa ti owo o le yan oju e se e ma gba ku to ni ko si asa to le to wo le to wo le yanju o ko si to ri awon yan ba gan ma so pe n to wo le se ile lo n pe ko si nkan to wo to si nkan to wo se ti ko si ni ni culture ati yoba ati jibu ko si culture ti to wa ni le to wa ni 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 nigeria ti o to wo le se e wo se ko se pe n gbogun ni dile yen egun ni dile yen so pe pe asa ni ko do parun e ba so pe okay mi ba ye gbe egun o emi o emi o wa le egun mo but e gbowo bayi ke ma fi se lo e gbo ba yin te ba le gbo en te ba le se o e ma se but e ma se but e mi o le se mo so pe owo le se nkan e ko si ba o le se ro pe em bi yan se lowo to ba o le se ro pe o ma affect em iru onje te yan ma like ati je iru bi yan se nsi onje bi yan se bi yan se ro nu si onje sha se ro pe ro wo te yan ni ba le se ro ko ma affect iwa eyan si onje ti owo ato nje eh ti yan ba lowo yin le ra ni si to ba wu lati je ah e wo ru eyin si e kin dana e ki fi be e ki fi be dana mo ti ma mo ti mo ti mo ti se ti je bo si pe o da pe like e like e ma je un se pe be se bi ru owo ye bi ru owo ye si ba pe to wo ye to wo ba wa ti yan ba like ti nkan ba wu yan je ara pe ara na dida e na ni je na to wa na o be ti yan ba wu yan je ele ko de si ka tan kin tan sin se n bayi ele ele o de ele ele ra ke je but n temi kan ni pa to wo ye ni pe to wo ba wa se n bayi to wo ba to to wo to wo ba wa awon yo ba ma so pe ah e so pe gbo kan mo ma fi yo ba si awon yo ba ma so pe ah pe eh owo eh awon yo to to wo ba to wo ba wa ti en ba fe ti en ba fe ra nkan se pe o ma isi lati lati ra nkan to ba wu je but eyo ba ti o ba sowo te ba fe te te bi ba npa yan te bi te bi ba npa ti o ba sowo a ma so pa gbogbo nkan lo ma gbogbo nkan lo ma wo lo eh eh yo ba so gbogbo nkan lo ma wu olowo je a ni gbogbo nkan to ma wo olowo da mi da pe owo to ma fi ra o wa o wa bi pe se be ah 
Back in Doko, see, bear money, money to another low and ah, oh, gow, cast fifty day wound in you. Say, cast you, oh, oh, yeah, jarro, could ye? But go away about what? Men ah, cast fifty day wound in you. My day, ye, check me, is that you, ye? Only, but it's a bone wound, ye, ara, I, ye, but to my soul, I would jenny, but could go to my fear. Now, when your mouth of Babel and my be out, that can make me so bad. Can you buy a woman, ye, could as well, or a little bit, only my ship, oh, well, could well, I die. So, Yato, what on jail? Yato, Ote, 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 shaking to Bawa. Think about Wunya, I'll grant to Bafe, I jay. Think by two by day, two by the pen, two by the door, and two by the door, lower. Think about walk on Wuni. Goodly, Kunira. Go well, let that. And oh, when you go well, let that, there was a lot of Fafira. Fabri, you pay. Kini mama she to ban do ya biti mi ti mo le se to de do mi. Oh my god, you run kota so koni e jai. No. Um, abi mi mo she 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 fuyi ba o le she ri she mi si. Uh huh. Ba o le she ri she mi ba o le she ri she mi si. To re mo le kwe ti fuwa o kwe ti connect ma o ni ba o le she ri she mi si te fi connect ma o ni. Ah. Sherry, be in kado je ki ma fun everybody ni number in. And what is Jotty like if I want me buying by him? Timon Loki Nigali crocheting, Tofi Baje. Okay, Shamma Queen, you join, you know me, you know, be meeting more son, Monsieur Monotti, Monotti. And the father law, the next time, Pewa, Mutia Moquemu, they say, a meeting, a meeting son, you know, the be me, a meeting son, no. There was a way a fool, she might get my cat, a fool, co, a co, co, to she. Se mo ko emi te ko sin ko tin ko ba te yan ba le se fun mi boye o se bo se kere to mo ma appreciate nkan bi pe emi ti so kini enu mo tu wo pe pata pata ma lo ra mi kini edu mi jo e mo mo pe ina mo but pe e ni da ti mu lo le ke tun se ke mu pada tori mi o te expect emi o ti e wo ti tun se eh mi boya e ti so da ti gbagbe eni se se tin ba tin ba so she mo kini e njo te mu wa kini e o ba o le se mo 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 appreciate o ya mi lenu gan tori mi o feel pe nkan to ye pe ke need nkan to ye ke se ko nse se yin mi o so pe e ba mi tu kini se emi tu so danu se mo mo ti binu kini e ngba te se a o o kon kon mi gan tori mo o pe eniyin o need ko ye ko se ko nse se ko nse ko si nkan to kon so she mo Twitter, ati soro Twitter. I join eh, mo ko mo ro kini eh, kini eh only come me gon. So she mo kwe tenyo ban soro lati, tenyo ba kon so kwe ah eni ye dao. Oya tosi kenyo soro lati, lati no, lati no kon, ino kon. So aro ni eh bi mo she ko kini eh mo so lati no kon kwe ah eni ko ni dati she kini eh ati kwe kini ko ti mo really appreciate ni pe anything to ba je owo e ina mo bi mo se ma se o scatter owo oko mi ba le gan te ni body ba be lowo mi elomi awa ni pe ah to to se fowo si bi bike kini boya o general bo o je dollar mo ni 100% oko mi ba le so mo tu so kini e se mo ko emi gan gba ti mi o so mi o believe pe awon eyan ma awon eyan ma fo mo ai mo ye awon eyan to to retweet e to tun se mo to tun but when you see that, be pe ke mi son kan boya e yon me wa ni mo ni lo re kini e. But buki bo gwa wan me wa ye kan wano tu ma ba mi so. Koto di ala e yon riba wan yon she kwe yi to. Ngo ti mo de ro kwe, o je kan wan yon she be ni. Wo re kwe kini e ti mo so. Mi o kosa bi kwe. O re si di se yon lo man polo wo. Mi o so bi kwe. Ah, ah, eni yon she kini e. A wan yon re kwe. Ah, ke yon le soro. And he told she said, for me, by most of them, be pay so. Kenny and more appreciate it. Most of them wrote this thing. She made me go sing. Go be in touch with the Kerito. Kenny and my sister run. Go by. Oh, me and pay. I really need. She made me. I don't know me. At the Alafia, me and you so con. To be conscious, go to your case. You go and say, you say, and you know, mom, it's in my life, in con. Mama so. But the man try at the Shalaye. He did see. So that. Mo fi kwe tin ba sha la ye e ma mo ko o o e ma understand as a correct eh ko ma ko ko ma ko je pe mo so pe e ke se kini e especially to ba je pe din le tin be se ma se ya to so mi oro mi oro ko sin kokan ti anything ti ti 
ti mo ba fe ti mo ti mo fi ope o ku die ka to ma so fun oro oro nisi awon aso yen ni o ni wala but ko see any other thing ko see any other thing mo dey appreciate bi e se ma nba mi sise this next segment is a really relaxing coffee break by Mahadev Akalu who brews coffee from Addis Ababa somewhere in Addis Ababa um Yeah, she she makes some coffee for friends and she contributed a recipe to uh the magazine for a story um an egg recipe for a story 10,000 ways to scramble a continent uh very tr- sort of typical Addis Ababa egg breakfast egg recipe but yeah, I don't know how much more to say about this. I feel like it's like very chill. Yeah. Being invited into um the home of somebody who brews coffee regularly, Maha brews amazing coffee. and the way coffee is consumed in Ethiopia is such a leisurely and social activity it's not um sort of a utilitarian task that you do in order to start your day or some such it's like you, what you do if you want to sit and relax and spend time quality time with people so we're really excited that Maha has invited us for that treat yeah i had um coffee at any
This next um, video will be um, hosted by Atom Uko, who contributed a recipe to the magazine. Um, there was a story called 10,000 Ways to Scramble an Egg. And there was a egg continent. recipes, a continent. Yeah. <laughs> there was egg recipes from all over the continent, yeah. four different corners. So Atom contributed a recipe to that. But for this segment, we went to the law school fish market, which is a famous fish market um, Wait, in Victoria talk, Island. Talk about your concept behind the numbers of the recipes. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Because people can't see that. Okay. Yeah. But um, well, get the magazine. So yeah, you, you should it. get the magazine so you can maybe try to have a guess about what number recipes are correlated to. And anyway, so Atom took us to this market and she sort of went around to different vendors and asked them questions about how they source the different seafood and vegetables and fruits that are at this market. It's like hyper organized for Lagos, which tends to be a bit more on the chaotic side, but it was also has its own sort of lovely chaos to it. It was a really great experience um, to get to know some of the yeah. sales folks over there. And I wasn't there, but you were there for, for the production. Um, but Atom, we worked with Atom. So Atom was also, besides contributing to the magazine, she also took care of the food for the magazine launch, which was we had the party in Lagos sometime last year, yeah, like late December. last year, December. And Atom was like the food, the director of food and, and, and beverages. So Atom is a chef and she consults for restaurants, but she also hosts her own pop-ups. And... I would imagine that she, you know, when she's in the thick of things, trying to get ready for a pop-up, she doesn't really have time to uh, connect with vendors and, you know, talk about um, why this is here or this isn't here. So just to see her in that setting at a market, not necessarily for work, but to, like, chat with the vendors was, was pretty cool. Yeah, and she also gave or gives a lot of insight into how she might use for example, a specific type of snail that she saw at the market. So she's really knowledgeable in, in um, general sort of Nigerian food and she's quite creative in her approach. So this was, this was a blast to film. Where do you normally get the fish from? Okay. Which... <laughs> you get it from the sea. So do you... So, um, does somebody bring everything? Yes, everything. 
They bring every day fresh. Okay, okay. Yeah. What's the most expensive fish you have? The most expensive fish here is red snapper. Red snapper. And it's the one that's the scarce one. I mean, you don't have it very often. We do, but it's normally scarce. Okay. Because it's expensive fish. Okay, okay. Okay. And then the one that's the most, which one is the most popular fish you buy? Yes, croaker. That one sells barracuda. Chinese. Yeah. That's the fish. And tilapia fish. Okay. That's the fish normally. Everybody does get. No problem. How long have you been doing? How long have you been selling this fish? Well, it has been long. How many years? <laughs> For me, let me say before I start all year, somebody said, now start to practice. Oh, 30 years. Wow. Wow. That's a long time. <laughs> okay, that's good. What's your favorite type of fish? What's mine? Your own favorite type. I don't have a favorite type because <laughs> you do have a favorite type of fish to eat. So what I'm do you eat? I'm tired of this. You eat the other I'm one. I'm tired of this. So I do exchange. For everything. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. So, go and go then. So, what do you want to give you to the How much are your snails? This one, 20. 20 pieces. 22,000. 22, okay. But these are these are the big ones. Small one, Puff. Small one, how much? 12,000. 12, okay. Where do you get your snails from? Farm. Which farm? Ondo State. Oh, you bring it all the way from Ondo State. Wow. So do they spoil all your way? How do you keep it when you are bringing it? And it just comes. How long is that drive from Odo? Oh wow. How often do you get the snails? Okay. So somebody buys it in, in Odo. What part of Odo? Ilaje? What part of Odo? Okay. 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 So you bring all the snails all the way down. So do people come and just buy only the shell from you? No, they, buy they buy everything. No, they buy it and we clean it for them. They don't come and collect the shell. Yeah? They don't collect the shell. Yeah. Okay. Did you know that some people take the shell and use it for face cream? No, you never heard that. I know some people do like the the slime, that part of the snail that is that part of the snail that is sticky. So people use it for that. Do, do people collect that one from you or they just just the snail? Something like this. Mm, they won't collect it. Okay. She brought this from Ondo State, um, which is at least four hour, a four hour drive and she gets it every Thursday. So I mean every Thursday have like a whole pack of snails but it's kind of expensive as well because 20 pieces is like 22,000 for the big ones and then 20 pieces for the small one is like 12,000 so snails are I guess a luxury food but you still find it on a lot of menus so yeah yeah I'll make stew I'll put it in soups I'll make like a peppered snail dish which is like an appetizer I've done I've used snails as well for a restaurant consultation project I did where I had like garlic and cream and put the snails in there with garlic bread so yeah it's a bunch of things i wonder if they moved the market from there the vegetable market from there here yeah, i think so madam thank you thank you just for you thank you How much are your prawns? One is the double prawn. Uh -huh. This one, one kilo is 6,000 naira. How many is in one kilo? It can be four or five pieces. Four or five pieces, 6,000. Yeah. Then this one? This one is 5,000 naira. Okay. This is, this is not jumbo now. This, this one is just small size. Small size. Medium size. So this one is 6,000? 
5,000. 5,000. Five, five. This one is even big now. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the size. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. You have lobster. You have lobster. Do you have, do you have the lobster to show me? Do you have any one that is out? Where do you get your prawns from? I see. How often do you get it? Every day. So everything is fresh. How long have you been doing this? Seven to eight years. Wow. This is crab now. Yeah. Lobster. Okay. Do you have the bigger ones or is just this size you have? We supplied everything. How often do people buy this one? How often do people buy the lobster? Every day. Every day. Okay. Okay. And the crab uncle? Every, Every day as well. Okay. So restaurants, families, uh, chefs, everybody shops here. Yeah. You have octopus. Can I see? You sold everything. Oh, okay. Calamari. I like to do uh, garlic prawns. Um, I like to. It's not a traditional dish. I mean, like I said, from where I'm from in Aquaibom State, there's a lot of prawns in our diet. Um, we do a lot of seafood, so I'm used to jumbo prawns. Obviously, slightly cheaper <laughs> when I go home, but I'm used to jumbo prawns. I'm used to medium. I'm used to all of this. So I think I grew up eating prawns a lot. My mom loves prawns. Um, we had it in pasta. We had it in salads sandwiches all like we had in everything because she was so obsessed with prawns um, but yeah there's there's different things that you could do and then grilled prawns as well the big thing you know I do a lot of grilled prawns as well so good afternoon ma. so what's uh, your vegetables what type of vegetables do you have I can see that one which one is that one no not the green one uh, Oh, okay. How many people? Do people buy it a lot? Yes, yes. Okay. Is it Nigerians or Oibo people? No, yeah, anybody. Anybody? Okay. And then you have purple cabbage. Is it the one? Is it grown here? No, they are grown here. They import it? No, not import. From where? From the outside people. Oh, okay. Oh, so they grow it in the north and then they bring it down. Okay. So do a lot of people buy the purple cabbage? Yes. Is it very expensive? That one is expensive. Not that how, how much is the purple cabbage? That one is 2,000. We have 2,000, not 5,000. Oh, two, okay. Okay. Are your avocados are fresh? Oh. <laughs> Where did you get them from? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay, okay. And then parsley, basil, mint, lettuce. Okay. How long have you been doing this for? Uh, more than 30 years now. Wow. From Babich. Oh, yes, 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 from Bar Beach. Bar Beach, Oh, wow. And yeah. has business That's been good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. So are your children going to come and take over? Yes. <laughs> they, need to, they need to come and help you. Yeah. <laughs> Where are they now? They're coming back now. Where one, are they? One is here with me. Okay, okay, that's good, that's good. Nice. So which one, which season do you buy from Kotonu? Now, season of the, like mango now. Mm. We have it at Kotonu now. Mm. So up until rainy season. Sure, rainy season. Then our own, own will come out. Shainu, 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 Shainu. So this is uh, interesting, uh, at least for me. So Michael Elegbede is a chef. I think he's probably one of the most interesting, like Nigerian, African, or just chefs, period, that I, I have met. Just really doing uh, interesting things. I, I just have to be honest, like, initially, <laughs> when I first like learned about Michael, I, I wasn't sure what to think about him. Um, and I think, Why is that? Because <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I was just like, I just saw his work on Instagram and it just looked like a little 
he looked beautiful and then he's also like a beautiful man in his face and he like he often takes off his shirt i'm like who's this person that does this <laughs> you know um but then i came to know him personally I, we've come to know him personally right. um we we're just at his place like what like a couple of days ago yeah for dinner and he's just like really thoughtful about his food that's that's the most striking thing about him like he thinks about his food deeply and when you ask him a question that you think is obvious he gives you um a really detailed answer that you hadn't considered and he's mostly talking about food and nigerian food and access um and so i i you know i love him actually uh and mrs zuko i think we'll describe her as like a traditionalist but she's also adventurous with yes. nigerian food yeah and what she does with it so we had this idea to put them in conversation right because we thought that they came from different ends of the spectrum when it when it comes to nigerian food right mrs uko mostly cooks at home mm-hmm. and she has a very popular food blog amongst nigerian diaspora and like, folks here and she has on her own been a student of nigerian food outside of the food she's familiar with yeah um like her specific region of nigeria and has traveled and been just professionally curious and not only that she's uh, a nutritionist yes and she also used to work as a marketer for a large multinational here a food a food a food um conglomerate so she sort of like observed food from all these different as mm-hmm. from the corporate aspect to the sort of like digital mm-hmm. and then also as somebody who cooks at home um uh, and yeah we had them in conversation and it was interesting uh, we were hoping for some fireworks and maybe there were some but both of them are lovely and yeah and i think what unites both of them is they love nigerian food or convinced by it yeah you don't need to sell them on the history of this food the sort of contemporary version of this food they are they are fascinated and in love with it so in that way um they had a ton to agree on and then some different approaches towards how that love is articulated in each of their food practices. Yeah. So it's, it's a great conversation. Sometimes I ask myself, but must must it be this tiny little piece of duck <laughs> because because for me I want the leg of the duck. Uh-huh. I mean so I'm tearing it, I'm pulling it. But yeah, okay, I mean look, we we have to get to the point where we can go somewhere and sit where there's no water to wash hands and we can eat this duck you know decently uh, so i i think those are the kind of things you're doing um and also exposing i believe you know nigerian food to a more global audience you know coming to nigeria it was very difficult for me finding resources mm-hmm. um to what we do and pro- like culturally food mm-hmm. uh, what we have yes um and you were one of the few people mm-hmm. who had taken that challenge on mm-hmm. historically representing and archiving mm-hmm. and telling stories mm-hmm. of your journeys to the village yeah. to the fish market yes um your garden yeah. your farms mm-hmm. uh and you g- given a deeper insight mm-hmm. to what it meant mm-hmm. to represent and understand mm-hmm. Nigerian food mm-hmm. and cuisine. Yeah. And it was very important to me to tap into that mm. I- immense knowledge pool mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you have to mm-hmm. help me understand, mm. you know, what I would be going into yeah. Yeah. Um, when I traveled. Yeah. We talk about fusion and I talk about fusion with with my daughter at him. Okay, we have arguments about fusion and I'm asking, are we there yet? Should we should we move mm. that fast? Um and i remember when this uh, this guy i am the later anthony boden came to nigeria one thing he asked one thing he said you know was that look if he comes in here he wants to see authentic nigerian dishes and of course the the word authentic a yeah. lot of debate about that but i always tell people that you know what is authentic i say if i put a goosey soup in my mouth blind I should be able to tell you say gusi soup. Mm. It doesn't matter how it was cooked, okay? Mm. So for me, I'm looking at us blending mm-hmm. Nigeria uh, within Nigeria. Uh, if you take me and Taoshe for mm-hmm. instance, and I start to eat me and Taoshe with amala. I mean, you 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 make me and and you get me to eat it with 
then we're, we're, we're talking. I mean, mm -hmm. that's where I am. I know you've moved on to fusion, but for me, you know, I'm saying, can we just fuse within Nigeria first? On the contrary, mm -hmm. I don't believe what I do is fusion. Oh, okay. Tell me. Um, <laughs> I believe what I do is a different representation mm -hmm. of how to experience what we okay. Okay. already have. Sure. I, I do want people to have that experience. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily you put a goosey in your mouth mm -hmm. and you're like, this is grandma's a goosey. Mm -hmm. But you put a goosey in your mouth and you're like, wow, what, what I saw is not what, what? I thought okay. I would taste. Okay. You have the iru, okay. you have the, 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 the you know, dried fish flavor, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. of the flavors mm -hmm. that are represented in the traditional way okay. of making a goosey okay once the, it, it hits your palate mm. you're like wow i i didn't realize this same flavor <laughs> profiles yeah. can be represented in this form and people are like this is fusion and i'm like it's not fusion <laughs> you know we think that that representation is trying to make it nice mm. I, mm. I don't think of it as me trying to make it nice mm -hmm. i think of it as a spectrum of mm -hmm. representation okay um the more you create diverse ways of representing things mm -hmm. the more value yeah, sure. inherently they mm -hmm. are fine dining yes for who <laughs> for the average nigerian or for who i mean for okay look yeah. is, is it for the average american you know because mm -hmm. even in america the american will not go to that average person yeah. might not go to fine dining mm -hmm. so when you say fine dining mm -hmm. who who are we well, selling if I wanted this? to <laughs> do fine dining for the European market uh -huh. or the American market, yeah. I would be in America or Europe. Okay. Um, being in Nigeria, uh -huh. I, I think it's very important. You know, what happens in third world countries, yeah. uh, which inherently what we are, uh -huh. um, is we undervalue sure. our food uh -huh. and our cuisine and our ingredients. And it takes a different perspective uh -huh. to say that whatever it is that the French are doing with their food, whatever it is that the Japanese and the Europeans yeah. are doing with their food mm. and the Americans, mm. our food are worthy of being on the same platform. Sure. Our food are, are worthy of taking an insightful, mm -hmm. a more um, sometimes even scientific approach sure. towards right. understanding okay. those ingredients. Yes. And in many ways, you're doing the same thing, <laughs> but because I, you you experiment with food all I the time. I know. I and know. <laughs> I was just putting you on this spot. No, 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 no. I no. know. It, I, but I love the question mm. because I think it's it's something that is often misunderstood. Yeah, I know. Um, in our in our cuisine, mm -hmm. in our representation, yeah. most of my clients are Nigerians. Yeah. You know, and there are Nigerians who have traveled mm -hmm. for food mm -hmm. to experience food in this art form because yes. at the end of the day culinary art is sure. an art form sure. and if you know i want to eat amala mm -hmm. and abula mm -hmm. you know i've traveled <laughs> to ibadan to eat abula i know that when i was you know getting married part of the things my mom gave me was a mortar and pestle and you know those kind of things you mean she didn't give you a vitamix <laughs> <laughs> so i mean I guess, you know, she would have given me a packet of pounder yam if, you know, if I was going, you know, getting married today. So as things evolve and as lifestyle change and as we live differently, mm -hmm. um, we also have to adapt Absolutely. quickly because or, or else we then lose the food itself mm -hmm. because we can't do it in the way our current reality would allow us to do. You know, the ironic thing is when, you know, a cuisine goes through this process of relative, I don't like calling it evolution sure. because mm -hmm. it, it gives a connotation that it's, it's creating a progression. Sure. Of, yeah, like, or you've no, abandoned the past exactly. and you want to, yeah. No, I, I like to think when you, you create different spectrums mm. to see a culture mm. through, then more than often, it, people gravi begin to even gravitate more towards like the traditional way yes, of yes, like how yes. it's been made. Because there's now a value mm -hmm. attached yeah. to the core essence I of know. how it's been produced. I and, know. and people are like, now that we know that mm -hmm. there's, you know, people like I don't eat pando yam mm -hmm. because I'm like, my, you know, like I would rather use my kitchen aids to mm -hmm. make pounded yes, jam yes. I, or like, you know, go somewhere mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. they use a month. Mm -hmm. Because when I want to eat pounded jam, 
you and want I'm the long, you want the I real want, thing. I want the yam. Yet, yet, yet. Because the texture is different. Absolutely. You know, no, absolutely. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about creating spectrums. Mm -hmm. And you have different ways in which you can experience that. Mm -hmm. And also, like, we, we're agriculturally and our economy and value change and yeah. our food system, yeah. the more you're creating different ways to use an ingredient. Like we look at Gary, mm -hmm. if all we are doing with Gary is making a yeah, bar and drinking it, <laughs> there's no value to it. A lot of things we can create yes. from our foods. Yeah. And we are the ones mm -hmm. that would create that demand Absolutely. for the farmer. I give you an example, Absolutely. parsley. Mm -hmm. Before now, before the advent of food blogging mm -hmm. and foodies and what have you. Yes. Oh no, you had to go to special supermarkets Absolutely. to get Just parsley. Three, four now, years ago. Yeah. Now, if I get into a market in Agboju, uh -huh. the malam there is selling parsley and much cheaper. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a whole bag uh -huh. for 200 naira. Yep. As opposed to these few sticks. Four years ago, like yeah. finding thyme and parsley and oregano, you know, was almost, they had to bring it in from Lebanon. Exactly, exactly. And I, I was mind blown. I was like, I don't understand. <laughs> and it's through the work you do, the demand of, you know, people yeah. realizing and also knowledge, because that's very important. I know. Because it takes a different understanding of how to grow these herbs yes. um, in, within our climate mm -hmm. to really be able to grow them for the masses. And people now have that. Mm -hmm. And that, that... I mean, did, did we think that strawberry was grown in Nigeria? That, that is... Did the we biggest... think that pears and I mean I see farmers attempting to grow apples Absolutely. and pears and what have you? Before we know it, I mean, Nigeria will be the destination. Absolutely, food destination. I mean, gosh, that's Just, that so exciting. That, those strawberries are still blowing my mind. They're yeah. so they remind me the last time I had strawberries that good, I was in Napa Valley. Uh -huh. No, like, I, I, you know, I, I, I went to, this was um, seven years ago, I was in Jos, and in this farm, not, a, not, not, you know, a heartwarming story because I saw so much waste. The lady had grown. We sat there, we ate strawberry until, oh gosh, we said, mm -hmm. we, we are full. And so I did the little bit I could, which was mm -hmm. get somebody in Lagos, introduce her, link her up so mm -hmm. that she can transport her, you know, strawberry to Lagos. But yeah. is it sustainable? Maybe not because the cold chain mm -hmm. required for something like strawberry mm -hmm. is still something that, you know, needs to be put in place, yeah. you know, just so that, you know, farmers in this axis can have this strawberry without us having to import mm -hmm. any, you know, strawberry into Nigeria. Yeah, you know? This is where people like me come in. Mm -hmm. This is where the idea of discovering the multiple ways of using strawberries mm -hmm. within our space. Mm -hmm. You know, in the time that we got our strawberries, we've made strawberry leather, mm -hmm. we've made strawberry vinegar, wow. we've uh, dehydrated strawberries mm -hmm. for chips, mm -hmm. we've uh, made strawberry marmalades, strawberry mm -hmm. compote. Mm -hmm. These are all preserve, preserved methods yes. that anyone would want to buy. I know, I know. And, but we, we this is how it evolves, you yeah. know, within this small crevice mm -hmm. of um, Eton, mm -hmm. we create ideologies mm -hmm. that helps the market mm -hmm. in sustainability. True. Like if we were making Eba chips, yeah. if Eba chips becomes a thing, mm -hmm. Eba, the value of Eba has gone oh, yeah. skyrocketing. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm going to be talking now. I'm taking of my food cap and putting mm -hmm. on my marketing cap. Yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I think there's a gap mm. in marketing in a lot of these things. Brilliant ideas I see, but what I seem to find missing is, is the marketing of it. Mm. Anything at all has to be marketed. You mm. know, if, if I'm a farmer in Jos, and I don't know that Abori exists, there's a problem. I can't go on that platform. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's this thing about and aggressive marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in the digital age. Absolutely. The noise, the noise on digital is mm -hmm. heavy. And unless you can successfully disrupt mm -hmm. on that platform, nice idea would just yeah, be a nice won't, idea. Won't so it's about, you know, real creative marketing around mm -hmm. some of these ideas that would help. Um, 
you know, trust me, when I started buying parsley mm -hmm. from Agboju Market, it was because a food blogger talked about it. Mm. This system, it's multifaceted. Yes. You know, um, for instance, in our kitchen, the plates we use mm -hmm. is made by a local artisan woman mm -hmm. in Ogun State yeah. that just makes plates for wow. local people. Wow. And that that is something that I believe creates an awareness and a mentality yeah. that is beyond just like, oh, what is this? Is about going to go in mm -hmm, here? Mm -hmm. Is this for everybody? Is this yeah. for a go see? Yeah. No, it's a, it's creating an availability yeah. um, and a, a diversity and expression mm. of things that we already use. It, they're clay plates, you know. So mm -hmm. you have clay plates that are being used for things that are, you know, supposedly fl fine dining. I know, and which is not a norm. Yeah. yeah. So we we and I, I many times question you know, my expression. Mm. And I I would like to think I've evolved yes. over the time that I've been here. Mm. Because I would I, I would think the way I started, I, I had, you know, background in mm -hmm. Western mm -hmm. culinary education. Mm. Um, so my initial expression of Nigerian food mm. was very, it was very Western. Okay. Uh -huh. You know, <laughs> uh, the white porcelain plates. Yes. You know, um, <laughs> everything with sauces and, yes. you know, and over time, the more I understood what it meant mm. to be Nigerian mm -hmm. um, and what it meant to represent our food, mm. the more I needed to represent that in, in my expression of yeah, it. Yeah. So from the plate word that we use, like when I see porcelain plates, I don't think of it as us. Yeah, yeah. I go to the market and the people who are selling plates, are, they're clay plates. Mm -hmm you know, traditionally. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the problem now comes where, you know, I'm serving someone with a clay plate and they're like, ah, which one is this? <laughs> a ball, a ball? Ritual thing ritual? that you are. <laughs> no. I know so many of my followers who have come to say, I've started a restaurant just by following you. Mm. I've learned this, I've learned that, you know, just by, you know, watching what you do. Some you're giving free advice, you yeah. know. I mean, I said I've never done a restaurant in my life, but they want this recipe, they want this special recipe, mm. and you feel good, you know, yeah. that yes, I've helped this entrepreneur, absolutely. She's going on, mm -hmm. she's succeeding, mm. and if she does mm. food on the table for her family mm. or food on the table for his family, so there is ripple effect absolutely the reason why you know there's parsley in the Aboju local market, market in Agboju it, market yes is because of the work you're doing yeah and that is necessary and it's not because of the demand of the minority yeah, of mm -hmm. the one percent mm -hmm. that's not why there's parsley in Agboju no. market because the people that go to Agboju market yeah are not the minority no they're not, they're the not. 1%. yes <laughs> they're everyone else yes and that's very important i didn't even know that but yeah. that's it's a very yeah. important significant and significant change in yeah in 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 the in the, the food space Absolutely. actually parsley is is used in a lot of northern dishes uh, there's this um uh dambu shinkafa mm. It's, it's a steamed rice and it's, it's a dish that a lot of, you know, parsley is used. If you also understand that the northern cuisine has some semblance with Arabian, Mediterranean, mm -hmm. they, they have a mix going on yeah. there. They use a lot of parsley there. Yeah. So, you know, yes, parsley might just have been there in the north. Mm -hmm. But because the Southern foodie, like mm -hmm. you and me, are talking more about it, mm. I'm then ready to adopt the Northern dish. Or I now see that, by the way, I can add parsley to my Nigerian salad, not salad. <laughs> salad. <laughs> salad. <laughs> Nigerian salad. <laughs> that, you know, parsley can make such a nice difference in taste to my Nigerian salad. People are beginning to understand the the reason why parsley is added to yeah, a dish, a dish you yes. know you finish with mm -hmm. something what, it's you, nice to the eyes it's, it's, it's aesthetic nice flavor wise, flavor -wise it's yes. good 
you know, um, as, you know everything mm. about it, mm. and beyond even parsley, thyme, and yes. oregano. Exactly, and we're getting them fresh now. Exactly. I mean, growing up, my mom always had that container of thyme. Mm -hmm. I but never, we always use and, dry thyme. And I, I thought, you know, for the for the for most of my life, I thought thyme was had to be dry. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> True. You know, it's more recently True. that we've seen fresh thyme, uh -huh. fresh rosemary, fresh oregan. Most of these things were dry imported. Yes. Now we can use the fresh ones in our yeah. cooking. What you just said <laughs> is literally an, an anthropological perspective yeah. on our food. Yeah. Why did we use dried? ingredients because they were imported it, it, nobody was growing it locally and if we were like we didn't have ways to preserve them but dry them you know so like it, it, it's beautiful and you spoke about evolution yeah. and you know massimo also said like any culture mm -hmm. that doesn't evolve, evolve should go to a museum <laughs> you know and now we realize that we're in a society mm. that we can now use more than dried parsley yeah. now we can use fresh parsley we yeah. can use fresh thyme mm -hmm. things that are often not a reality of our cooking mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. fresh thyme in jollof rice takes a very very different yes like flavor, flavor profile. dimension yes from from yeah from yeah it's... from the dry thyme yes. that are commonly used and it's great because then we're able to experience things that are traditional yeah. in a very different you know perspective we're in a revolution yeah of food right now the louder mm -hmm. we are in that revolution you know the more the 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 the, the realities of our food system mm -hmm. the more people speak about it yeah the more access that the rest of the 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 majority mm -hmm. have to the realities of our you, you know, because we, I, 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 we have to be our voice. Absolutely. We have to. Absolutely. Like, like they say in Nigeria, allowed it. Yeah, allowed it. <laughs> <laughs> loud it. Mommy, or you're more say, hip than me. Or they say, Soros okay, Soros, Soros okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is loud it. So we, we, we have to be the voice. Um, and thanks to social media, yeah. we have the opportunity to loud it. Yes. If we don't loud it, Nobody's going to loud it for us. True. That, that's, that's, True. that's it. We have to be the ones mm, that yes, tell our story. Yes, yes. And that's why I'm in Nigeria, not anywhere yeah, else. Yeah. You know what is beautiful about <laughs> our reality now in Nigeria is mm. the ability for us to have the impact that we're having yeah, in it. Yeah. I mean, the work that you do, and you're, you're, you're such a creative. I'm not trying to kiss your ass, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't cry. But like, the images you take, the way you express, yeah. you know. Yeah, I just, you know. It's remarkable. Um, ginger. Okay, okay. So this is the pineapple ginger. We're going to harvest is, this tomorrow. Yes, oh uh, yeah. I they're ready. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Look at that. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. they're budding out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it smells so good mm -hmm. right out the soil. Mm -hmm. And the leaves. Mm, yeah, the leaves, like yes. Tea. We, yeah. I use it for tea all the time. Oh, that's, that's good. It's, it's, um, it's like that. a cross between lemongrass and ginger. Exactly. Mm, it's lovely. Like, hmm. oh, oh, you have to take mm, off your mask mm. for this. Mm, that's lovely. Right? Hmm. Very earthy. Very earthy. <laughs> I think the reality of any society, the people who kind of hold on to the cultural and nostalgic and most reverent like perspective and expression of like the cuisine will be the people who are the least privileged, the people who are um, in the most rural areas, yeah. the people who that's all they've ever known. And because of that, they, they, they keep it, they, they hold it, you know, very reverent. Um, and it also shows itself, you know, in, you know, we, we're black, we're the largest black country uh, in population in the world and you see Nigerians that were in 
that were taken to, like you, you take Bahia in Brazil, for instance, um, Nigerians that were taken to Bahia because that's what they've known. That's what they keep, you know, reverent. They held on to the culture of Nigerian religious practices, Nigerian culinary practices. So they, like you, you, you hear Akaraje, mm -hmm. that's Akara, you know. And so coming back to Nigeria, when I did, I, I didn't stay in Lagos to learn about Nigerian food. I went to the most rural regions around the country to experience um, what it meant to really express Nigerian food. The fermentation processes, mm. the drying processes, the, the cooking processes, um, all of those smoking. things, the smoking, yeah. all of those things are, are, they're most vivid in the rural areas amongst the people of the lower threshold uh, of, of the society. And that's unfortunately the reality. Like, you know, when I was traveling through the South South and the Southeast, you know, I got to understand how the Civil War yeah. changed the way people oh, ate. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, because mm. people were migrating through forests mm -hmm. and people didn't, you know, because you couldn't always have fire there were dishes that were made with raw ingredients. So yeah. now we have like sauces, sauces <laughs> you know, palm raw. oil and pepper yes. and things. Yeah, just because you didn't have fire to do it. Yes, yeah. because you would expose your location if you had fire. Yeah. Um, and that became a delicacy. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, you know, a reality of the time that yeah. they were in because it, 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 you know, the origination of those dishes were from traditional dishes mm -hmm. that they had mm -hmm. in um, the cultures that they were coming from. Um, so going back to the reality that we are in a, first of all, we're in a global society. Um, I don't think any culture is um, exclusive of um, the influences of um, the people and the cultures that they're surrounded by. Um, especially being a country that had been colonized. Um, yes, we, we know so much about the British colonization, but before then we had a lot of influences that cultural colonizations. Um, and I, I don't think necessary, like uh, learning new things and incorporating it into um, your reality is terrible, but obviously the British didn't have good food, so <laughs> we didn't need to. <laughs> All my British friends, sorry. <laughs> but the reality is, when did we start using curry? The curry powder. I think 60s or something. Yes, and 60s. the reasons why we, the same reason why the Indians use curry is the same reason why we use it, mm -hmm. because it. It was an amalgamation of spices that the British yeah. um, had uh, collected through their journeys mm -hmm. and colonizing the world. Um, and that is, it's important to know that. Yeah. But it's also very important to know what we have and what we had. And that's, that goes with the, the documentation. Yeah. Who's telling the story? Sorry. Yeah. And what knowledge and perspective are they coming from? Hmm. Uh, you know, as you as you were talking, I said culture. Over time, can can would we still be able to hang on to it? I I. I well, what are we hanging on to? That's the I, question. I, 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 well, okay. Because I, I they, don't they, no, but but you know, we, we talked about the Nigerian food, the Nigerian culture. Like depends so, on how far back you go. Yeah, but you know, I mean. It, it, yes, it's, 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 it's not, I know it's not yeah. static, but would there still be a culture? That's that, mm. that's 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 what I'm. We like our food too much. There I will know. Still be. I know, but you know, over time, over time, you know, I look when I do roast yam on my page, mm. and I look at the engagement on that post, I look at the likes, I look at the comment. It tells me that people are, roasting yam was in the farm. Mm. 
I like the flavor of roasted yam. I'm a foodie, um, but really, if I was not a foodie, maybe I wouldn't even be talking of roasted yam. And I saw that something like that is already far-fetched. Mm -hmm. So over time, I'm asking, would there still be a culture? That, that yes. I, I worry. I, I, see, I see your concern. Mm, I and worry. I, I think I, I, I try to look at other cultures mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. to, in some ways, understand the realities of mine. Mm -hmm. Representation is key. Mm -hmm. And coming back home, I realized the amount of shame that the generation after me, the mm -hmm. 18 year olds, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the, how much shame they have to the culture in yeah. general. Yeah. Like, you know, not even to the core of not even wanting to speak the language because oh, they want to be so tell me that in, no, in until, speaking English. It was until the musicians started speaking it. Mm hmm started infusing the local language into music and then <laughs> representation yeah. that's it right mm -hmm. representation mm -hmm. so now you have representation in language people yeah. you know rapping in Igbo yes you know Davido in Hausa, using Yoruba, in Yoruba, Hausa. Yeah. now the language is more relevant mm -hmm. and there's no sh because now they're getting billboard awards mm -hmm. and <laughs> there's no shame in yeah. understanding what it is that they're saying mm -hmm. and and I think it's also the same for With the food. food. Yeah. The more we have representation in spaces beyond um, Buka, yeah. the more the generations after us will begin to realize that you can be, you can, you can, you be, can, cool. be, you, you can be cool and, and still eat Eba and understand Eba and understand Amala yeah. and Begiri. Yeah. The more it's in spaces that are more esteemed mm -hmm. not because the food is is has never been esteemed mm. but the story of it had never been told mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. to be understood mm -hmm. more the more the story is being told and understood the more relevant it mm -hmm. becomes mm -hmm. what is happening now we have so much more biodiversity and we would be doing a disservice to both ourselves and the next generations if we don't use the ingredients that we have now to create, create yeah. more. More, yeah. I mean, because, you know, sometimes I, I, I ask myself, how, how did my great-grandparents come up with the fact that you can go to the forest, pluck a balumo, mm -hmm. African star apple, who told them you, it was edible? And I asked myself, what am I going to leave behind? Mm -hmm. They've left Agbalumo for me. They've left Amala for me. Mm -hmm. They've left Edikanko. They've left Ekpankuko mm -hmm. for me. What am I leaving behind? And it's, it's something that bothers me a bit because, I mean, I'm creating based on what they found out. But can I create something and leave behind for the next generation? Look at the food and say, okay, yes, we'll do this. Because if you look at Akara, who thought of it? Who thought of Moi Moi? It, because they, it, it was created from beans. Who, who, whose idea was it? What can I then leave behind? Then? So complex. Yes, I mean, but so complex. I should, I should try and leave something behind. Yeah, absolutely. I should try and leave my yes. boy and, and Sasso behind. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'll leave Eba Chris behind. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a studio visit with Sergio um, Avose. But before that, I want to say that, so, We've been, our company, running our productions. We're making a documentary, a docu-series. So we've been in Lagos uh, recording oh. stuff for that. We came uh, December was when we started the first round of production here. And it was crazy. Like, a bunch of things happened uh, personally and in the production that um, sort of, like, took things away from us. But, like, by, by, by that I mean, you know, we just... Um, we got distracted because of personal and you know work stuff. Then we resumed production um, early uh, early this year. All this to say that Ruth flew out from. You came back from Ethiopia. Yeah. 
uh, on a Sunday mm-hmm. and a Monday we went filming. Yes. Um, you know, after this really hectic month. Um, and so the first person we started filming for for this um, event was said Juro. Yeah. Uh, he's a contributor to the magazine as well. He created a piece um, for the magazine. You know, we commissioned him for the magazine and um, you, I mean, hopefully you all get the magazine and then you, you take a look at it, look at his work. But it's um, pretty powerful stuff. I think what's interesting is like the motifs that he yeah. uses. Yeah, he uses um, sort of these yam. Yeah. Well, one of the things, one of the motifs he uses are like these yam shaped things that kind of are are sometimes limb like and sometimes like incorporated into like cars, which are also another motif you'll find in his painting. He's a painter and sort of some collage work too. Um, Sculptor too. Yeah, and and you know, sculptures or sculpt like three D elements also make it into his paintings. Yeah, he's very dedicated to his to his work, um, and he's sort of like from from what I can tell at least, um, you know, his his life revolves around his art, and so where he lives, he does so because he chooses to be in a place where. Uh, that provides the things that he needs to work uh, and he's focused on like creating more work and and pushing himself i think one of the things he talks about is not being ordinary but Mm -hmm. having his work be um be distinct yeah yeah and then sorry he just he just had a show open also in france i'm not sure if it's in paris it's the africa gallery so if anyone from there is uh, watching this, they can go experience his work live, which is like a consuming kind of painting where there's a lot happening and you can sort of spend a lot of time in one corner of his work. Yeah, and also buy his work too because yeah. it's for sale, I'm sure. Yes, it's enjoy. Fun. Yeah. My name is Sergio Avose. I work from Lagos, Nigeria, Eco Tourist Pacific. What I do with my work is I document my life experiences. I use a nomadic approach to execute my concept. So I see myself as a traveler in life. I use my work to document my time, my experiences. This is a piece. Yeah, it's so big. Yeah. You want to talk about it? Yeah, sure. When I was um, introduced to to this um, project, so I was asked to celebrate, uh, to present a concept that celebrates newspaper as a wrapper and um, a container. And I was asked to present the concept on the front page of a Nigerian newspaper. So the first thing I did was to uh, look for a way to interpret the concept that it will also fit into my narrative. While interpreting the concept, it should also go with my um, my narrative, which shows me as a traveler in life. So I use a uh, literary expression, which is metaphor, to present the newspaper, which is um, used here to represent a ship, and um, the food to that is being contained to represent. Uh, I use it to represent the, the, the slaves that were being um, confined from their places of origin to various destinations. So the newspaper, which is the ship, is used to contain the slaves and also to move them from their places of origin. And they were being used in the farm, which is presented here for uh, manual labor. And um, after the introduction of uh, machineries, they were being um, discarded. And that is how uh, newspaper is being discarded after uh, the food has been eaten. Just like how the slaves have been, after they've been used, after they've been used and um, they end up being um, discarded. So that is how I was able to interpret my concept. And Presenting it on the front page of a Nigerian newspaper, there's a newspaper in Nigeria called Daily Sun, but I don't want to uh, directly use the, the, the name of the newspaper, so I had to turn the daily upside down and present it um, artistically yeah. in this um, manner. So, and I've been able to use some um, uh, uh, font, some typographies, like you see slavery here, you have to take um, 
yourself into the painting to see some other um, some other details like the slavery, the food as it has to do with the team. So that is how I've been in, able to interpret my concept. You see uh, these faces that are automobile related faces. That is um, my prominent um, uh, visual concept. All my paintings has these faces which talks, which, um, which shows me as a traveler. I see myself like I'm moving. And what I'm doing is I'm documenting things I experience. I'm documenting people that I meet. I'm documenting time also. That's why you see some time pieces on the faces. And you see uh, the, the face that is automobile, like it's moving. So that is how, that is how I create my pieces. So that is like the prominent features that you see in my work. So what I do is I have the idea in my head and I allow my instinct to, to direct my process. So that is how I work. I'm very, I'm very open to um, ideas that I've not been used to. That is why you see my work is very experimental. Yeah. Yeah. So that is how I work. So it's instinct based. You're from yeah, yeah, instinct based. Like yeah. Sketching. So I don't have a fixed, I don't have a fixed process. Yeah. I just follow my instinct. I execute different media that feel comfortable, that I feel comfortable with that specific time of. But what I do is I make sure this, the team stick into my head, yeah. and it's and the team directs my process. So yeah. it's it I believe it uh, it's something that I have it's a process that I have developed over time. Yeah. So I'm already used to it, and it has never failed me. So I did this piece in 2020. Um, it, it's it's uh, a portrait of my wife and my son. I did this when I went for a residency in Luanda. So I was in the residency, and I was trying to imagine my my wife and my son how. How, what they were doing at home, how they were experiencing, how they have been, how they are living life without me. So this is my son, he's a boy, and um, this is my wife, and there is a tree at the back, at the back here. So I was trying to imagine the environment. So that is, is a portrait of my wife and my son. So that is what I've been able to do there. Are you fine? Yes. So this is like a remembrance of um, a time when I was still in a home, Badagri. I grew up in Badagri. So my dad was late and um, when my mom was working, so whenever I come back from school, I used, she used to drop me with um, a hair stylist. So I actually, I was exposed to so many things at that time. You know, when you, are, when you share space with women and I was the only boy there so I was I was exposed to so many things and um, so it's something that I will want to let go the experiences that I want to let go so that is why I'm painting it I just want to paint it out of my mind I feel every piece should be able to 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 relate with people to be able to talk to people in different manner when it is when the idea of a piece is fixed, I feel it's not, I don't feel too successful about it. Well, I enjoy when people see my piece and they tell me, well, I'm seeing it in this, in a different way. I think that makes it successful. It shows that I've been able to, to, to present a piece that somebody else is seeing it another way. So I don't, like this, for instance, is too fixed. So it's just a man walking. But this, for instance, you see different things happen. Does food play any sort of like significant in the work that you do? Food? Yeah. Yes, sure. <laughs> this actually indirectly looks like a yam. Mm -hmm. You see, it looks like a yam. Like, I don't directly present it, but in a way, when I look for a way to distort, I like to look for natural things that I will indirectly use to present my forms. What time would you tell us how easy your work? Wow. This was actually, sh I did this work when I traveled for my last residency. And um, I, you know, I'm becoming aware of uh, activities happening in my society, uh, political activities. And um, I noticed that uh, most of the people that are like um, the innocent people, people like me, that are not involved in government. Um, so I use Teletubbies as symbols of innocence. So I call this piece Abuse of Innocence. 
So if you look at this piece, for instance, I have male sexual organs. Like, I didn't directly present it, but they are like the scrotums coming into the, um, um, I will call it vagina of the teletubbies, which is wrong. You shouldn't see teletubbies in the same space with this. So I'm trying to describe it with how our leaders, how they abuse innocent citizens. So that is the idea of this. And the, the burning, the shapeless uh, part of the canvas is just like, I'm trying to describe it on how this country is. This country is going shapeless. It doesn't have the shape anymore. Like, that is how I see it. So, like, and the burning, the tearing and the burning, like after things have been destroyed, there is no way that they can be merged and still look the way it's supposed to look. So. That is the idea behind this series. It's a new series. It's not well accepted. It's not well accepted, but it is my mind I could say what I want to say on canvas. So whether it's accepted or not, it doesn't, it doesn't get into me. It doesn't bother me. Yeah. You have to take a deep look for you to see that there is somebody behind. And this is the penis of the, of the beast. So, um, Therese Nelson is actually, so Therese Nelson is a chef and also a friend. And she, I think sometime last year, she just like, we were texting, texting each other. Um, and she just sent me, she was telling me what she was reading. She was reading Akile Mbembe, who's this, I believe, Cameroonian um, theorist. And he wrote a book called Necropolitics. And so she sent it to me, and, uh, and I was trying to understand it, and it was like too much in my brain. So I think I, I put it down. Um, and, and then later this year for the magazine, or, or sorry, early or mid last year for the magazine, she contributed a piece on fu fugitivity and blackness and sort of like finding freedom through cooking. All this to say that Therese is like one of those, one of actually a few people in my life who are, chefs but also really deep into uh, have a theoretical grounding so they read um all these theorists and and you see you see this um this perspective seep into or really be embodied in their food uh and i really do think that is uh, in, at least in my experience that it's a pretty like black thing like a black chef and i you know another is Omar Tate in, in, in Philly, we have these black chefs who are not just cooking, but then engaged in like critical theory and it's entering into, into their food and I think it's amazing. Anyway, so she wrote this piece and somebody is making noise in the background. <laughs> yeah, anyways, I wonder if this will come through, but maybe it won't. Yeah, this is Lagos, so there's, there's always noise. Yeah, but that's and fine. maybe this will be cut also. Yeah. Um, but, so you had the idea to put Uzo in conversation with Therese, and Uzo is the CEO of the African Center, or the Africa Center, which is our co-sponsor. Yeah, co-host event. Or event. co-host yeah. the event. And that was because we had a conversation with Uzo leading up to this event, and he mentioned um, necropolitics as well, and that being an interest of his at the moment for, for something he's researching on his own. So it felt like a natural Yeah, fit. Hearing. So Uzo is a writer, um, as well as the CEO of the Africa Center. And, um, it, you know, obviously to do this event, he... It was his support that makes that is making this partnership possible. We had reached out to him early last early last year about this, and he was down. So anyway, we wanted to incorporate him and his ideas into uh, the programming. Of course, um, we were interested to hear what he w was thinking about the issues that we broached in the magazine, and so um, it made sense. You want to talk a little bit about vulnerability politics? Is just, just just I mean, just like a definition. Oh, I think I um. I think, mm, mm, I don't know. Well, I can talk a little bit about precarity. Yeah, and sort of like the, yeah. the different ways that precarity has been defined by theorists and writers. Um, folks like Saidiya Hartman come to mind when, when you speak about precarity or the idea of necropolitics, though I have yet to read that book. So I think about um, 
vulnerability or precarity as sort of your proximity to life chances and and another word death right so how this pandemic has made um those precarities very clear and the investment of institution power the state um and who's whose life they're investing in and whose life they're they're willing to to yeah to watch die so um though it's a dark (laughs) way to end this program it's also something that is unavoidable yeah it is dictating people's i mean i think it's it's appropriate that the terminal program is about terminal things (laughs) maybe so yeah so yeah i um these are great people to to have discussed this topic and i'm sure they'll do so with a lot of care yeah so much of what was so beautiful about um when they taking over this ep- this um issue of sandwich and just kind of um put it in the diaspora front facing was that you got to hear from folks who are kind of stepping into the authority of culture right and doing it in a way that um requires for the reader right like the the hundred dollar price tag right requires something from you just on purchasing the the sort of work but then also um can be confronted with things that you might not have considered in the way that they're being presented um but are you brave enough to tell those stories authentically and fully and full throatedly? Right. Um, it's kind of the question. And I hope that like the 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 thing that most had the exhibit to my mind was about was sort of providing a framework for folks to have the facility to to, to tell those kinds of stories, right? To have, you know, the power of like the digital platforms that have sort of sprung up in terms of programming around that the exhibit has been the archive of these stories, right? The you see uh, you in the museum space, right? The sort of um, intangible, like this program exists, and if you don't live proximate to the space, you can't go. And you you saw these amazing things happening, these conversations happening, you can't have access to um, digitally. Now we have this repository of these brilliant conversations that um, young people, especially, but just and I always also like am kind of fatigued of this. Um, we put so much on like the function of these concepts for young people, but we need them. Like we need this context. Like it's working shots, working folks in these spaces that need to have, be affirmed in this in these ways. And young people right. tangentially are gonna be fed by seeing a different kind of possibility, but the work we do informs them as well. And if we are in if like ill-informed, um, then that's as reckless and as harmful as lack of visibility. Right, right. No, I think you're right. And I actually wanted to, though, in your in your work, I mean, you talked a little bit about subliminal messages, right? And I'm interested also in how you developed your way of countering those messages. Like, what was that journey? What was that path? Um, I mean, for me, it was 2008, 2009 become so important. And I was sort of at the first like wave of career. I think a lot of chefs are watching this, like, um, you sort of finish culinary school, you finish your training and sort of get those first couple jobs out of school. And I always thought catering was going to be a space I was going to be most autonomous. And like, it, because again, subliminally, like, you talked that like the fine dining space, the rarefied air is only a place that's valuable. And culturally, I couldn't show up in those spaces fully from like sort of with my whole self. And so that was always a, ne- a never for me, like it was sort of a not a not possible. Um, but the examples I was finding of mentorship and sort of visibility in the caring space and sort of the um, the entrepreneurial examples were always sort of right front facing in those spaces. But the economy downturns and this business that I had started and was sort of giving myself over to, um, is looking shaky. And I realized at that point that um, I just didn't know enough. Like I was, you know, about to give the next decade, next, you know, phase of my career over to a thing that felt not just preca- precarious, but also um, it felt like I wasn't really showing up fully informed, right? Like, why didn't I know more Black chefs? Why wasn't I in community with more Black chefs? Why was, like, why didn't I know enough about our food culture? Why was I subscribing to this sort of monolithic soul food narrative? Um, Because my my understanding of the diaspora and sort of food ways was not what it should have been. Um, So I needed a starting place. 
And so I started this website really as a place to be a home or a house for what I was learning and what I was sort of discovering, um, reading everything and kind of searching for somebody with some answers. Um, and it's like, that's the thing, right? Yeah. Like, it, it's so strange when you sort of shift perspective slightly, right? Like it was, I grew, I grew up in New Jersey, like right approximate to New York, right? I, kind of, I came back to New York City at a time when Pierre is working and fully, fully thriving in Brooklyn, right? There's a whole culinary landscape in Brooklyn, in Harlem, um, where Black chefs, Black bodies are doing amazing work, but because my lens, because my focus was so skewed, um, I wasn't in community with those people and spaces and um, themes. And so the moment I shifted perspective, um, building community became so 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 much easier. Um, I think the, I mean, we turned 12 in January, but so much of the work I do now is sort of contextualizing all of the, the, the Kind of, like conceptualizing all of the work that's coming out, right? If you, to my mind, sort of thinking through, like, I, don't know, I think that there's something really particular about the last 12 years, at least for me. And I think sometimes I sort of discount the fact that I've, my, my like eyes were open in this time, but there's certainly examples of folks who have been contributing, um, hoping for, praying for, um, a, a, a more sort of collective recalibration of um, focus, but it's been just dope to watch chefs who back then wouldn't even talk to me about black identity, um, open full restaurants in the like in the space, and you know sort of writing right. more expansively. The writing has been so ridiculous over the last decade. Like there's right, been right. so many people who are finding the kind of language. I only add this that um, it was only 2015. Um, Tony Tipton Martin convened this event called Soul Summit in Austin, Texas, on the 150th anniversary of emancipation, and it was the smartest, best voices you could think of in food, black in the black voices you could think of in food, writers, historians, chefs, etc. And even in this place in 2015, we still didn't quite have the language for. Um, our food ways, right? Like we, this was just before she put, um, Tony published the Jemima Code. It was, we certainly had How on the Hog um, by Jessica Harris. And we had, I feel like Michael Tweedy's book had come out maybe before that as well. So we had, so we had a language started, but we still in that moment, we just come to a place where we kind of could contextualize how we wanted to frame black culture in this country. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm saying that I fail to say that um, I'm constantly humbled by and encouraged by the fact that we are slowly but surely kind of um, seeing the, the necessity and um, naming things, right? Creating a emotional and verbal vocabulary around our food waste because it's slow and steady work, but it's also work that if we do right, if we sort of are a community with when we're doing it, um, it's gonna have like long-term implications, right? It's gonna be, this is forever work for a lot of us. And so right, right. Um, being like, being sort of, li right. And like, like lamenting time passing shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be a negative, right? Like it's, to my mind, those slow and steady um, wins mean that they are gonna have roots, right? Like they have um, roots that hopefully won't make our historical memory <laughs> so short. Right, right, right. I mean, it's an amazing thing and it is an amazing transformation. And I think it is one that is, is you know, like that is, is so important, especially at this current moment. Um, you know, again, it's what, what is it, how do you revise history that writes you out of it, right? And how do you, and how do you also show people that like that, that absence, right, is not indicative of an essential aspect of person, it's more indicative of the stories that are told, right? And so, you know, again, you know, I don't know, I, I read a lot, like I often read newspaper articles, and you know, they say never read the comments, and I always read the comments, <laughs> because why not? And I think what's what's so clear to me, whatever you're writing on, but especially around issues of race, but you know, we we put race in its own category, but just issues of America and Americanness, right? And then you know, like or just issues of politics and foreign relations globally, like is people act as if um, two things: one that like race is a subset that can be ignored, 
And two, they act as if a certain set of people have not been fundamental actors in the shaping of the present day world from the beginning. And food is an essential part of that story. So, you know, I think one of the things that's, that's, that's crucial, right, is like food is foreign relations, right? The reason that there are, there, are, there are Black people in the United States of America, the reason why the continent of Africa is chopped up in the way that it is, is because food is foreign relations. Ground nuts in Nigeria, I was just looking at a poster of someone's, the ground nuts or peanuts in Nigeria. They're the posters from the British, quote unquote, the British war effort in the 1914s or 1940s around World War I and II. Nigeria is one of the largest producers of peanuts in the world. Um, and that was a colonial enterprise. There's so many bodies were devoted to doing that. So much of, you know, you can think of like that that's a major supply for British soldiers, right? Then that's a contribution, an essential contribution to foreign policy. Let's go back a little bit, right, to talking about, you know, the the reason why people ship bodies across the the ocean and killed so many people in doing so. Rice planting, sugar planting, That's right. cotton planting, you know, we're, we're talking about food, but like, you know, and so, no. and then also not thinking about like the fact that the people who were, were, were planting these crops are the people who had the knowledge of these crops. So you have a whole system of economics that is founded on the knowledge of the labor of these people and the the reason the world is the way it is today the reason the united states was able to take a position of primacy is because you know you get if you get 300 years of free labor right like and you can just bank that cash like you're going to be able to do whatever you want i don't care who you are somebody's going to come in here and do everything for me for free for for you know like i don't know the first 30 years of my life yeah i'm going to be in a very good position to start you know exerting my will on other people and so i think it's about centering that historical time, but then it's also about, about, you know, when we start talking about Black Lives Matter, when we start talking about reputation, when we start talking about not seeing Black chefs opening restaurants in the same way with the same ease that say a white chef can open a restaurant, all of this stuff is connected. You know, I think that we, we don't, like we need to be more explicit about how this is connected. Like we need to be much, yes. much more explicit about it and much, much more concrete, you know, so that somebody can't walk into a restaurant and, you know, sit down with, you know, macaroni and cheese or sit down with a cheeseburger or sit down, you know, like with whatever dish they're, they're eating and whatever sort of like sophistication or pseudo sophistication that they imagine themselves to possess and not see the historical context that allows them to be there. That I, I think is so important. <laughs> To, to so many of us, right? And I think is is a transformative piece. One million percent. I also think that there's something really powerful in um, centering that work in community. Because I think this, what you're talking about, 100% has implications in terms of how the public or folks outside the culture are going to interrogate, sort of engage um, with our culture, right? This sort of, that's sort of, that's the Eduardo Jordan factor of it all, right? Like the, before he opened June Baby, he had a whole encyclopedia on his website that sort of asked people to, to come to his table before a dish was even cooked um, in a way that was as respectful as <clears throat> any other culture that you would sort of engage with globally, right? But there's something so, that's, and it, to my mind, it feels um, sometimes like, again, like it's like, you know, sort of attention span and sort of the necessity of this work to exist on multiple levels is key. But I also think that there's something so empowering about starting from a place that you can actually control and starting from being in community, right? How are you, as the practitioner of this craft, how are you messaging? What are you bringing to, what are you requiring of your guests? What are you, how are you, um, sort of expressing the, the how, how you frame your, your aesthetic, right? Like it's it just, there's a, there's sometimes this sense where without, because we aren't explicit, because we aren't um, sort of talking through why representation matters, why we are sort of so, like th there's a defensive posture to it that gets a lot of the context lost in um, the frivolity of it, right? It gives, it's easily dismissed when it is in context. And if you're talking about representation for representation state, well, I don't know. I mean, they just, you, if you've been following this sort of fave chef situation, like that's, that's representation for representation state. It doesn't sort of, um, suggest that once you what are you going to say when you get there right like in the early days right. of um doing this work a lot of a lot of folks were so beholden to this notion of being visible but if you don't have anything to say once you're visible um 
then it sort of diminishes the F- <laughs> exactly. So I just I love so much that there's so much vigor happening right now, so much thoughtfulness, so much um, clarity, and I also think that there's something really important about um, talking to stress on the continent in these places that are so black and so central, right? Where your culture is not. A lot of the times, I think you talk about talk to American chefs, and so much of what you're hearing in the way that they talk about our food ways is you hear trauma in it, you hear defensiveness in it, and you hear kind of, um, <clears throat> you hear a posture that um, is reacting to um, the precarious nature of being Black in this country. And I think that there's certainly a, like a sort of conversation to be had and, and certainly um, precariousness um, globally, but it just, it feels different. It feels different to talk to chefs in the Caribbean who have black faces on the money and uh, you know what I mean and sort of have a, are in a place where the producer the restaurateur the, the staff the culinary schools are filled with black lives and while certainly your relationship to power is a perfectly valid conversation to have to be in a place where it's all black everything has to right. be different the posture which, that you do your work has to be different and sometimes I, I wonder um, well, I, I'm encouraged by this kind of conversation with folks who live in places where they aren't, they don't have to defer power, defer visibility to anybody. That's a, that's, that's a, a kind of legwork that you don't have to do, right? You right, have right. tons of other problems to attack, but right. representation is not the, the problem. <laughs> right, right. And contextualizing is not your problem, right? Like it, you are in context. You're in, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very true. It's, I think about like going out to eat in Nigeria I mean, also just think about like what it means, like and how, you know, people aren't aware of how restaurant culture or food culture, like the gathering of community culture around food and how it's served is just different in different places. And that there is no sort of like sophisticated is not is not one particular thing. Like there are, are forms of, of sophistication. I think about this a lot, you know, and when you talk about sort of just thinking about what it means to dine here in the United States and the, the culture around, there's a particular culture around how you consume food. Uh, and then also being able to experience how people consume food within the Nigerian context. And, you know, there is the, the thing I love about it, right, is that culture is mutable, right? And that this idea of the exchange, everything, it's a constant exchange. There is never any essential culture. So when you walk into a restaurant in Nigeria and you see elements of what it might look like if you're in New York, LA, that's a really amazing thing. And then you look at the menu and you see Nigerian food imagined a different way or presented a different way that's one thing but then there's also the way that we that we you know like there are also some things that like we do as as Nigerians in terms of how we eat and consume food and what it means to consume food so rather than the production of the food in a certain way right where you know you have things that people are taking pictures of and posting like it's really about the community built around the consumption of the food you know so that you know I'm out there and I was saying I've never been to a Nigerian dinner party that hasn't just kind of resulted in people standing around eating switching positions like talking laughing you know versus the more formal thing where you're sitting and then you to your left and to your right which seems very in some ways like very uh very produced right versus a a more you know and that's the thing is like i i I hesitate again with the terms because in one what what seems produced in one particular setting can feel very natural and what seems like, you know, natural in another setting can be very produced. So, you know, we have to think about that. But for me, I think about Nigerians and the parties I've been to or, and whatnot and the way that people move around with food and use food as a way of connection, you know, as opposed to food as a way of, of status demonstration. And I think that kind of thing mm. is really, really, it just is really important to me. And I think it's important to, to broadcast that and bring people into that. And, you know, I was saying again, like if you, experience it and it's not for you then that's great be on your merry way but if you experience that and it changes your way of relating to what's presented in front of you to how people cook so you know all things again about status like who who gets credit for doing the cooking who gets credit for doing like all of that you know can be shifted and transformed just based off of the way that you actually consume the food and i think that's something that i'm beginning to understand a little bit more by sort of you know by interacting with folks like yourself with folks at mofad with you know, Chef Pierre himself, like that is all part and parcel of what it means to to be a person who eats, right? And to be connected to what it is you're eating. And I think that's so essential. So I'm going to be sitting with this notion around um, food as status symbol for a minute, because I don't know that I've, I, that's something I need to consider a lot 
I'm gonna have to write something about this because it's so dope. Because what you, because I, I think that's that's something. This it's a critical idea, right? It's a critical framework of how I say this. Um, I think when, especially when I talked about that, like that sort of 2008, 2009 moment of like recalibrating priorities, I was having this like thought around context that there felt to be um, this sort of ballet, this kind of cultural ballet that I was being um, sort of complicit in. But like, you know, we aren't, we don't, we sort of presenting this food culture, this kind of dining culture um, to a public in a way that feels not only a historic, but just wildly irresponsible. Um, and if I'm gonna be part of this sort of mechanism, um, I need to really be clear about what I'm contributing to it. And without any sort of, that wasn't, that I was complicit, also not bringing my full self to, this, to the table what are we doing? What am I doing? Right? Because it, it, it becomes super frivolous super quickly. But there's something so particular about um, this tension that I'm hearing. I talked a little bit about um, this sort of defensive posture um, in American dining that you're seeing from a lot of um, Black chefs. It's like that defensiveness is, I think, is, is something in that sort of. Um, frivolity of the sort of status symbol of dining, right? That how do you, you know, you have these, the, 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 the fine dining construct becomes so critical because that's the one place that, um, you know, people are willing to spend dollars at the, the the business model for those rarefied spaces, right? Like so many chefs trying to be like the Michelin star, this and the sort of um, 11 mass and park that. It's like, yeah, but if you aren't considering what is being sacrificed um, to run that kind of space, if you aren't considering the fact that um, the learning curve or sort of the cultural learning curve um, for folks engaged in our food ways don't match um, the sort of, to your point, right, the sort of diasporic nature of these food ways don't fit into these sort of formal, constructed, um, colonialized ways of dining that is trying to fit a square peg in a round hole for the purposes of subscribing to and being part of um, this really particular sort of status performance um, right. that in a lot of ways COVID has shown us is not only frivolous, but doesn't even work and doesn't even serve the folks who are so, so right. essentially like, you know, at the top of that food chain, right? Like, right. you know, right. I don't know. It's we something don't even that's know so dope. Things- we don't even know if they really make people happy. We don't even really know if people are actually enjoying being, you know, and like, yeah, again, it's the performance of it. Like, we don't know, like, what does it mean to put on, you know, your expensive clothes and go out to a place where, you know, they serve you, you know, the smallest portion of something that you're supposed to ooh and ah at the taste of and not say very much about when you can't, like, you know, you can't really be in community with the other people around because everybody is, 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 enamored of the production. And maybe that in and of itself is a cultural product and we can recognize that for what it is, but it's not the only cultural product and it's not the only use of food, you know? Like you can, again, I think when people come, you know, I've had friends come to visit in Nigeria, right? And you think about the way that people eat or, you know, what the the role of food at our weddings, right? Like, and how people then, you know, are served and how people consume and how, and like people are like, whoa, you know, like as opposed to the wedding where you sit down and you listen to speeches for, you know, an interminable amount of time, you have one in which people are moving about dancing. Like, are you giving speeches? Maybe. Is anyone paying attention? Maybe not. They're talking to their friend. They're eating the jollof rice. They're doing, but that's like, that's important. And that's like, that I think warms people in a way in the same way that I can go to, I don't know, like, Denmark or to wherever and be amazed by the way that they produce culture around food or the way that, you know, like they produce, produce a uh, community around food, which is very fundamentally different from, from how we might do it in Nigeria or how it might be done here in the United States in black American communities or whatever. And I think that's, it's just, again, acknowledging that those different points exist and being, and not, and like you said at the beginning, not defending your point, but presenting your point. And I think that is, that's like, that's where we, we, we really need to be. And I think the work that you do, you know, the work that folks like Chef Pierre does, the work that, that MOFAD is doing in presenting um, the, the role and influence of African American food culture on American culture as a whole, I think that brings us 
to a point where it's a presentation and not a defense. And that's, that's crucial. Yeah, that's one million percent. Um, I also think there's something really important about, um, it feels so strange to be in a place where we are just getting to a time where we have language to sort of express our food ways um, in a sort of front face and public way that lives outside of our culture. To then sort of do, to have to also um, contort it and sort of shift is um, to, to sort of, it feels strange just to try and fit it into this super narrow box um, in the fine dining space. And that's uh, so wantable from chefs. Like it's such, it's such a goal for some folks. And it just feels like we are so far off of being in a time and a place where <sighs> to be able to, to have that kind of space requires a kind of diligence and legwork and kind of um, sort of cultural foundation um that makes the that cuisine translate without having to do work that doesn't ex that shouldn't exist in that kind of exchange right i think who's that young the, the um chef in nigeria right now a young guy i remember when he was in the u.s and he had gone was going back to he's in this episode on this issue of sandwich michael uh, uh, chef michael michael yeah yeah michael yeah like yeah, he's I'm so fascinated by what that looks like, but I, I, I would argue that um, him trying to sort of, him being listed up in this way and him doing the work he's doing only exists if he's doing it on continent. But if he was trying to do that work here, I don't know that we, that the Zeitgeist would be quite ready for um, that kind of space because what, what would happen, I think, is, and I think we have examples of it, um, some other chefs tried it. Um, what would happen is, um, it's that brick and mortar. It's that sort of all those elements you talked about in terms of the barriers to sort of accessibility to kind of create that model and have it be sustainable wouldn't work. And you also then have the other layer of that kind of ballet, a kind of contortion trying to explain yourself. Um, mm -hmm. That in a place like Nigeria, right, where you are, where, where you are central um, to calling narrative, right? You think and play. You don't get to play until you have um, to become central right. to the narrative. Right. So I just right. I love watching his work, but I just wonder. Um, I, I think success relative to some, some young chefs that are coming up, like that's kind of who you should be looking at. But that also requires you to do the work of priming the, the zeitgeist, right? To be ready right. for right. those right. kinds of stories. Right. I mean, it is. I guess that is the the black person's burden, right? Is like. Not only are we doing the thing, but we're also doing the thing beyond the thing, so that people can appreciate the thing, right? Which is, which is a lot of work. It's it's a lot of work, but I mean, someone has to do it, I guess, and that is our that's, right. that's our mandate and that's our task. All right, so that was that was the Sandwich Magazine programming, or the yeah. Africa the African Scramble programming. African Scramble issue on Sandwich Magazine, which is issue number four. This is the end. Thank you. Uh, this has been a long relationship with Sandwich Magazine. I think we started, where were we? August or something. No, you were in San Francisco, no? We were in San Francisco. So we were in San Francisco writing, no, we were pitching our episodes, our docuseries to like these, um, what do you call these people? Platforms. To like platforms, like the big um, distributors. Uh, and then we got a call from from Sandwich Magazine. W when was this? This was like summer? No, right? Yeah, it was summer. It was warm. Okay. It's like summertime last year. And then so we've been working on the magazine as we've been shooting our own docuseries. And then the magazine launched. And then we worked on the, the release the release party in Lagos mm -hmm. and then now we started working on the, the, digital, the launch. digital launch this has been like almost a year of, of, of the, at least nine six months or something no more like nine months of this. Oh, okay, okay. anyway so this has been like a lot of our lives but the great thing about this is that everything that is in the magazine and the themes and the concepts are things that we are wrestling with personally and also in our docuseries so it hasn't been a distraction it's sort of like everything has dovetailed perfectly um, even uh, being here in Lagos, we took a trip to uh, a farming community about uh, a week ago um, in central Nigeria. And uh, part of what the magazine is and part of the reason for the high ticket price, which is $100 for the issue, is because we want to transfer resources 
um, to black folks on the continent. And so anyway, being in this farming community just sort of like crystallized for us the sort of places and people that we want to see the resources transferred to folks who are dealing with issues of climate change and um, who are at the mercy of global capitalism, uh, whose livelihood and work is impacted by agricultural policies set both in Abuja and also in Washington. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would like to say it's been this magazine and its iteration, if you pick it up, which you should, and you can buy it at sandwichmagazine.com, um, was this this uh, exercise that we did along with all our contributors, all our writers, photographers, um, and image makers last year, last summer. Yeah. But that exercise has been ongoing for us, and this digital launch has been the latest version of, of our thinking to how food um, intersects with power or interacts with power and then the docu-series will be like this this even longer project of, mm-hmm. of grappling with these questions um, around food and vulnerability and power and pleasure and, and policy and all those things. So we're really honored you were able to join us for this. Yeah. And Shout out to Zach. Yeah. Uh, Zach Seeley, that's yes. his name. What up, Zach? Uh, for just his support. Let's keep it real. Like, Zach gave us a bunch of money and he said, let's do this. And we did it. I mean, the money was spent well, just to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're excited to yeah. pay contributors from the continent and from the states um, yeah. and create this thing and keep creating based on this idea we had on a brainstorm in a Google Doc months and months ago so we're glad it stayed alive for this long and can i just let me just clarify my statement about money <laughs> what i'm what i'm saying is that like we had the resources to do what, what we wanted to do and i think that's important like it's not often that you get um resources to tell this particular kind of story and think about food in a way that i th- I, I don't think is often conceived um which is like how do you think about food from the not just the perspective of black folks but for like black continental folks uh, black folks who are who have been moved to the margins and who are moving out of the margins by uh, by their own will um, and also how do you just like upend like narratives that are boring you know how do you tell some shit that isn't the same old shit you know I think that's that, that was important yeah and so the contributors and conversations you saw are like only some of the stories in the magazine there's many more so uh definitely give those time because if you like any of this there's a good chance you'll love those as well and yeah and you're going, you're leaving to Ethiopia. with gratitude yeah. <laughs> from lagos yes thank this you this is tunde and ruth saying good night good night <laughs>